everyone, and welcome to the Samokas Town Hall on fixing Nigeria's elections, put together by YEG Africa in collaboration with Excess and supported by the European Union and Channels Television. The very robust debate tonight and analyses on electoral reforms that cuts across a wide range of stakeholders will begin in NS. But first, let's take this message from the executive director of Yaga Africa, Sam Senitodo. Good evening, viewers. My name is Samson Itodo, the executive director of Yaga Africa. It's exactly 965 days to the 2023 general elections. It's obvious the challenges of our electoral process are enormous, and it requires leadership and decisive action from diverse stakeholders to fix. This is why Yaga Africa and our partners are hosting this town hall this evening to address the declining quality of elections and loss of faith in democratic institutions. If the electoral process is reformed, it will improve the quality of public leadership and governance at all levels and increase public trust in democracy and democratic institutions. Tonight's town hall is an opportunity for stakeholders, especially citizens, to reflect, engage and build consensus on electoral reform priorities and timelines. I therefore invite you to participate actively by sending SMS to 0903 800 or send an email to watchingthevote at yaga.org. You can also join this conversation on social media using the hashtag FixElectionsNG. This town hall is viewed across the world and aired on Radio Nigeria Network Service because we believe every voice counts. And present at this town hall this evening are representatives of key democratic institutions. I'd like to specially thank the EU SDGN partners, namely European Centre for Electoral Support, who is a co-host of this town hall, the Albino Foundation, the International Press Center, the Nigerian Women Trust Fund, Clean Foundation, the Policy and Legal Advocacy Center, Westminster Foundation, the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, BBC Media Action, Institute for Media and Society, INEC, and Premium Time Center for Investigative Journalism. Special thanks to Channels TV for the partnership. I'd like to specially thank the EU delegation in Nigeria for making this possible through the EU Support to Democratic Governance in Nigeria program. Before I leave, please remember, it is exactly 31 months to the 2023 elections. Therefore, the time for electoral reform is now. On behalf of all of us, I say welcome to the Citizens Town Hall on Electoral Reforms. Thank you so much, Samson, for those opening statements. So how do you measure a growing or developing democracy? Well, election is one of the indicators and perhaps one of the major pillars of any democratic society. The recruitment process in a political system must be well structured and properly backed by to allow the electorate to choose or replace the government through a free and fair process. But the question is, do we have a free and fair election in Nigeria? Can we truly say our elections are credible? Now, here's the premise. There have been uh, committees and reports constituted by different presidents since 1999 to date in an attempt to fix the untidy parts of our electoral law and process. Let me take you through some of these images. Perhaps we'll enlighten our minds and get us in the mood for us to get the conversation started. And so, we look at the cost of our elections in Nigeria, and over the years, this is what it has cost us in our major elections. From 2011, this is how much we spent. That is over 139 uh, billion naira spent in our elections, which comes to 1,000. 893 Naira per voter, that's $9 if you're watching us outside of the country and you're trying to make sense of what it means. So if you look at it, there is an increase between 2011 and 2015. So, uh, I mean, there is a decrease, actually, from 2011 to 2015 to about $0.5. So from 2015 to 2019, it actually uh, went down again because it's a, by dollar rate, it went down, but in Naira rate, it's way higher. So 
Let's look at some more implications of what our elections are giving us and what we are taking from it. Uh, if you look at, uh, we are 90, 965 days, 31 months, two years, and seven months to the 2023 general elections. So what does this mean? It then means that there is a window for us to fix our elections, and this is saying the clock is ticking, if you look at it. So elections, we finish elections, and people run to court, people challenge the process of the elections. So this is what it means. 2007, uh, 2007, 1,290 cases, uh, petitions came uh, over the elections. In 2011, it was 732 cases, 611 in 2015. It went higher in 2019 to 809. If we do not fix our elections, what will it look like in 2023? Uh, well, put that... Uh, on one hand, and let's get a sense of what this means. So th there is a gestation period for our, our electoral amendment deal. So in the seventh National Assembly, this is what we got. There was a commencement of the process, the final passage, but this is what happened. It was assented to in March of 2015. In the eighth National Assembly, this is what we got. There was a commencement of the process in 2016. So if you look at it, 2012, that's where it started in two, uh, of uh, two th uh, the seventh National Assembly, but uh, quite three years before uh, the elections uh, of 2015. Uh, in 2016, there was another process which began uh, under the Akwere Madu and uh, Bukola Seriki uh, 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 leadership in the National Assembly. And so uh, it was, the ascent was declined in December 2018. So let's take a look at what the turnout has been in those years. From 1999, all these uh, major elections in Nigeria, and you can see the percentage uh, in the increase and how it went down from 1999 52% people came out to vote in Nigeria of the registered voters in the country. It went up but, uh, by over 10%, uh, so 69%, 57%. It went down in 2007. Don't forget, that was the year a president said the election that brought him into office was flawed. In 2011, it went lower than it was in 2007. In 2015, it did very badly, 43%. That's the first time we had our election from 1999, just under 50% voter turnout, and 2019, it wasn't a very good outing as per voter turnout. So all over these 21 years, these are the electoral uh, amendments that we've seen uh, on, uh, of our electoral act. But I guess that is perhaps the journey and gives you the idea of where we're coming from. But where are we at at the moment? There are bills by different lawmakers seeking to address the many challenges to the Nigerian electoral process. But for a moment, let me introduce to you our guests tonight who are going to be discussing these issues from our Buja studio, Lagos studio, and virtually we'll have people dissecting these issues for us. So from our Buja studio, I have the INEC uh, chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubo. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for joining us tonight on the, on the program. And also, I have the representative of uh, Senator Ovio Omar the deputy Senate president there with us from our Abuja studio. And also, I have uh, uh, joining us here in our Le uh, Lagos studio is uh, Ms. Yemi Adamalekun. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And also, uh, I will be introducing some other guests as the program progresses. But before we get started all together, there is a message from the EU head in Nigeria. Take a listen to him. I know it must be very difficult uh, to abstract from the COVID-19 crisis. Certainly, the European Union has used every waking hour for the last months to assist Nigeria in the response. But the issue of democratic governance is of such importance that really it cannot continue to be sidelined even if we're in the middle of a perfect storm. And of course, it's not for the international community to dictate the way forward for Nigeria. That is entirely for Nigerians themselves to decide. But I feel very proud for the European Union to support a debate of this nature that we will have tonight to guide the decisions to be taken. And certainly the importance of democratic governments for 
the, the European Union in Nigeria has been immense. Since 1999, we have been present with uh, election observers at all major elections. We have provided more than 100 million euros in support for all the key interlocutors. And we have seen some quite important progress over the years. But we also understand that democracy must never be taken for granted, not in Nigeria, not in the European Union either. And looking at the situation in Nigeria, there are really a lot of positives. And then there are, of course, as always, anywhere, some reasons for concern as well. And if we look at the positives, I mean, look at the engagement and the resilience of the Nigerian population, the competitive environment for politics here, the lively debates like the one tonight, the vibrant civil society that is here, the excellent experts that we meet in the key institutions and the media as well, I think are some of the real important positives. Maybe on the slightly more concerning side, looking at the intimidation, the vote buying that we have seen in some elections, and, and maybe the confusing picture of competing courts engaging in electoral issues. And then certainly a, a situation like the Corky State election, where international observers, including myself, uh, had to take shelter from the shooting taking place there, or even more disturbingly, the woman that was killed in the aftermath of that election, this is certainly not something that anyone would like to see as a new norm. So as we look ahead, it is really key to ask some of the important questions, whilst at the same time making sure that we cater for the necessary inclusivity. Thank you so much for your thoughts there. So let's get started. Uh, we have more people who are joining us uh, tonight. Uh, like you said, uh, Yemi Adamalekun is in our Lagos studio, the executive director of uh, Enough is Enough Nigeria, and also Dr. Akin Akinbolu, executive director of Media and Society. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. Of course, we have uh, joining us virtually Nigerian actress Amoni Oboli. Thank you, Amoni, for your time tonight. Kobam Asukwa is a, mu a musician. Thank you so much, Kobams, for, for your time here. And of course, uh, Cynthia Mbamalu of Yaga Africa. From our Buja studio is uh, the de uh, former deputy of the Senate president, Senator Ike Ekwerimadu. You know so much about it. He's a member of uh, the Senate uh, Committee on INEC, and uh, he has uh, uh, had his hands on the Electoral Act Amendment over the years, so we'll be getting from him. Of course, we have the representative of um, the Deputy Senate President, who is spearheading the amendment in the National Assembly, uh, Mabel Amalola Demokun, is advisor to the Deputy Senate President. Thank you so much, indeed. Dr. Hussein Abdul, thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us also. Let's get started, everyone, shall we? So let me begin the conversation and let's hear from the man who is at the center of this conversation tonight because the electoral umpire is at the center of whatever we're discussing tonight on Nigeria elections. So, Professor, it's good to see you and uh, get us started, uh, would you please? Uh, you also had the, um, uh, the regional head of um, uh, the election bodies uh, uh, in, in, in the, on the continent. And you've seen how elections are conducted elsewhere. As the man who sits on that very pressured seat, we're not talking about electoral management, election management in Nigeria today. What is your major problem if you consider, since you got into office, that if you have the magic wand to fix, what would that be? Well, thank you very much, Sean. Quite a number of issues, actually, and the management of election in Nigeria is not radically different from the management of elections in the sub-region. You referred to my role uh, in the ECOWAS network of electoral commissions. Um, the same challenges of uh, managing the political environment, um, the behavior of the political actors, um, the cost of conducting elections, um, the issue of technology in elections, reducing the incidence of violence in elections, quite a number of um, um, challenges. Nigeria is part and parcel of the regional community, and we have, uh, we have had our own challenges. So, um, quite a number of issues, uh, one of which is the deployment of technology. We would like a situation where the electoral legal environment is um, um, reformed, 
in such a manner that will continue to deepen the deployment of technology in elections. We are so far happy with what the Commission has done since 2010. Recall that there is a trajectory. We started in 2010 with uh, the biometric register of voters. Uh, and so in 2011, the Commission essentially um, updated the biometric register. And we did the same thing in 2014 and in 2017 and 2018 over a period of 16 months um, in which we added 14.2 million Nigerians to the register. We would like to see this um, 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 enhanced. The second is biometric accreditation of voters. And there's a new innovation introduced in 2015, the smart card readers um, come, uh, that go along with the permanent voters card. Uh, we've achieved that. We are looking forward particularly with the 2015 amendment to the Electoral Act that empowers the Commission to um, deepen the use of technology in voting, particularly in the area of electronic voting, to see how far we can go um, a notch higher. And the Commission is committed to introducing at least electronic balloting um, in the major election we are going to conduct next year, which happens to be the Anambra governorship election in November. And thereafter, with the support of the National Assembly, we hope the legal environment will improve such that we can also go ahead to transmit, collect and transmit results electronically. At present, the law doesn't permit that. The system is essentially manual. That is on the technology side. On the other um, side, we are essentially concerned about the failure or inability to penalize electoral offenders. This has been at the heart of many of the challenges we faced. Some elections were declared inconclusive simply as a result of violence. And I like the way you started, Shom, by referring to all the efforts made in the past, at least over the last 11 years. Recommendations have been made by one committee after another, and it appears that there is a convergence uh, of intention between particularly the executive and the National Assembly on the issue of punishment for electoral offenders. I recall the recommendations of the Waste Committee. Uh, nothing was done to the recommendations of that committee. In 2011, we had the major, major post-election violence. The Lemu Committee was set up. It made the same recommendation, accepted in a white paper um, by government, but we didn't make progress. Then 2015, 2016, uh, this administration set up the Ken Namani Committee. And the Ken Money Committee made the same recommendation. And there have been movement also on the part of the National Assembly with several private members' bills for the establishment of the Electoral Offenses Commission and Tribunal. We hope that this time around, as part of the reforms of our electoral process, we'll pay particular attention to that issue. At present, the Commission is saddled with a responsibility that I've repeatedly said that it has neither the capacity nor uh, the um, absolute legal backing to implement. For instance, INEC is settled with the responsibility of prosecution of electoral offenders. How do you prosecute electoral offenders when the first step towards prosecution is arrest? INEC has no police. We have to rely on the regular police. We have been working with the Inspector General of Police in that regard. Arising from the general elections conducted last year, uh, 16 case files have been forwarded to the Commission. And we are prosecuting those offenders in the places where, uh, where the offenses were committed as provided by law. But we have um, our constraint in that respect. Secondly, there has to be proper investigation that will provide the evidence that will lead to successful prosecution of offenders. We simply have no capacity to investigate offenses committed. But here we are saddled with the responsibility to prosecute electoral offenders. And we have very good staff doing conscientious good work, but some of the offenders may be the commission's own staff. Uh, it's very difficult for any organization to penalize or punish or prosecute itself. So um, we uh, completely agree with the recommendations made by previous committees and the kind of movement we have had from the National Assembly through private members' bills to establish the Electoral Offenses Commission and Tribunal. Showing up, I've said this over and over again, that any nation that does not penalize its electoral offenders is doomed. So we cannot talk about democracy and um, 
fair, free, credible elections, and in the context of COVID, now safe elections, without ensuring that those who violate those laws are penalized. So essentially, these are the two items that come to mind immediately, deepening the use of technology in the conduct of elections and punishment for electoral offenders. All right. Let, let me uh, ask uh, Deputy no, Senate Pres uh, former Deputy Senate President, uh, Senator Ike Ekwerumadu. Uh, Senator, you've heard what... That, that's a fantastic background that uh, Professor Mahmoud Yakuba has given us tonight, which we serve as a premise for us. But from your own point of view, looking at the past amendments and the elections that we've conducted in Nigeria, what would you consider as perhaps Nigeria's biggest election problem? Uh, okay, uh, Senator Ikurimadu, maybe I, I should get the question uh, back again. So um, I was asking that what would you consider as the biggest problem of Nigerian election today? I think the greatest problem is the implementation of the laws. We have sufficient laws regarding our election and electron, election management. Going back to um, history, you will recall that uh, the last major election we had before the Civil War was in 1964. And then thereafter, two years later, we had the coup and then there was Civil War. So we didn't have democratic practice, and that means uh, the electoral reforms, electoral practices were stopped for about uh, 35 years until 1999. The implication is that a lot happened. You know, just like if you park your car for 35 years, I don't want to start the car. Obviously, you're going to have a lot of problems. And so, in 1999, we had an election that was, of course, not very perfect because of the time lag we've had between 1964 and 1979. And thereafter, we also had disrupted elections and, and the democratic practices up to 1999 when this, all this started. And so, even after 1999, you'll recall, too, that it took nearly about uh, uh, 11 years, up to 2010, where we had the first major electoral reforms, both in the Constitution and Electoral Act, for which I also superintended. So in that year, we laid a proper foundation for making sure that both INEC, the Judiciary, and the National Assembly, which are the major institutions of democracy, got their independence. And so they had the first line charge to the uh, revenue, to the uh, Consolidated Revenue Fund. And thereafter, we built upon it. You know, so we've made some of, uh, of amendments since then, including limiting the time frame within which election matters must be conducted. When the, post, the pre election matters also have to be concluded, we also dealt with the issue of uh, making sure that uh, those who, are, uh, who have political interests do not become members of the INEC. We also uh, amended the, the constitution to give INEC uh, administrative independence. We, uh, uh, we also made sure that parties. Uh, who do not measure, measure certain, uh, get to certain measures in elections at the register because so that we don't uh, uh, overcloud the electoral uh, um, process. So many, so many amendments took place, including the uh, issue of the electro electronic voting. Section 52 of the Electoral Act of uh, 2010 forbids the use of electronic means. So, but years later, I think about four years later, just shortly before the 2015 election, we amended that section 52-2 to say that ANE can now use electronic electronic means to conduct elections. Now, because of so many other issues, I'm sure the chairman will know better, they have not been able to apply that section 52 to, uh, to use electronic means to conduct elections. And of course, the soldiers and the police people who help in uh, conducting elections, their conduct has been uh, less than satisfactory. And then, of course, they have their own um, ad hoc staff, you know, sometimes they run into some problems. So I think the major issue is that of uh, management of uh, the process itself. You know, but as I said, remember that I've had a lot of uh, 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 issues in electoral management because of the military intervention. So I believe we are making progress. We've made a lot of progress. So, so as I said, if you park a car for 35 years and you fix the car, obviously you will never know that the wiper is not working until you drive at night. And then maybe the headlamp is not working until you drive at night. So when you, when you discover it, you fix it. And that's exactly what I've been doing in National Assembly since 2010, fixing all those areas we discover. And now let me say that I must commend the National Assembly for their efforts in electoral reform in Nigeria. 
I'm, I'm not aware that the government, the executive, however, sent any executive bill regarding the amendment or a new electoral uh, act since 2013 now. So most of the efforts you are hearing are National Assembly members, the individual member, uh, member bills, you know. And for the first time in 2019, the INEC, ahead of the uh, public hearing, sent a comprehensive uh, suggestion on how we can approach the um, amendment to the Electoral Act. And this time, what we intend to do is essentially to repeal all those uh, uh, Electoral Act and the amendment there too, and be able to have a comprehensive new electoral act that you can make reference to. So and we are working with the, the Independent National Electoral Commission to deal with this. We met with them in Lagos, I believe, in February or March, and then we'll be able to we'll try it as much as possible to right. reconcile our so, views. So the next thing we'll do now is to have um, a public hearing so that the civil society and the members of the public will be able to make their input before right. we take so, it back to the National Assembly and then become so, begin to the process of enacting it to law. All right. So let me ask uh, Senator Kurumadu, where said that? Uh, let me get the representative and the advisor to the Deputy Senate President who is heading this process of uh, amending the law. Uh, a lot of people will wonder. We had the, uh, the LEMU report. We had uh, uh, another report just after the, the LEMU report. And uh, a lot of people will be wondering why we already have a template that can work for us. We are doing another process now. For your principle, are we putting into consideration this reports or not? Thank you very much, Shion. Thank you very much, Shion. Thanks um, for having me. So, um, like uh, the distinguished uh, senator said, um, electoral reforms in Nigeria have come a very long way, and just like the INEC chairman, chairman has said. So, what we're doing essentially at this time is to um, follow up the researches that have been done and all these committee reports that have been put together and to decipher what the country needs at this time. We have um, currently two bills that we are trying to harmonize. Um, the, 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 electoral the electoral amendment bill that deals with the, the general provisions and another one that was sponsored by, the, the first one was sponsored by distinguished senator Uvio Magege, my principal, and the other one was co-sponsored by the distinguished senator with Senator Kiari and uh, Senator Gaya as well. So we're putting this together, and that affects um, the issue of uh, electoral violence, electoral, create, the creation of an electoral offenses uh, commission to manage electoral violence, and all other issues, all other sundry issues. So following the trajectory of the reports that have been submitted up to the Kenny Amani report, we are picking out issues that currently hail the system, and we are hoping that we can tackle these issues headlong. It's a good uh, thing that we are discussing electoral reforms today on the anniversary of the World uh, Parliament Day. All over the world, people are discussing elections and electoral reforms how democracy and democratic institutions can be better enhanced. Um, you know, with the new uh, uh, parameters that, that COVID-19 has um, introduced, we didn't capture that in our bill. This is an ongoing conversation. We have a lot of other issues we are trying to harmonize and put in the bills. So uh, the conversation will continue, and we are taking right. into consideration the reports. Those reports are like tools for us to work with, Mi and Mr. Uh, this is where we are. Yeah, so fantastic. So you can see right there behind me, these different reports that we've had, Justice Uwe's report, we had the Sheikh Lemu report, we've had the Ministerial Committee review on the Justice Uwe's report, we've had the Kenny Namani-led committee report. All of these reports are on the ground, but a lot of people believe that our elections are far from what we dream it to be. We'll take a break, but when we come back, we we'll hit the nail on the head and find out what are the real problems of Nigeria's election and how are we going to solve them. That's the reason why we are here on this three-hour ride. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. And let's get back to the conversation. But don't forget that you can be part of the conversation. Some of your thoughts we're going to be sharing live because this is a town hall is involving the experts, the stakeholders, and, of course, you as a voter and as a Nigerian. Of course, we have our guests and uh, members of audience uh, from on, on Zoom. Uh, we are here with us, Amonio Boli and uh, Kobam Sasuko are there, and Professor Yemi Shania uh, also there. Uh, in a moment, we'll also 
also let us see some of the audience that are going to be participating on the program tonight. Of course, in our Abuja studio and Lagos studio, uh, we're getting thoughts. Let me run back to Abuja studio and get the thoughts of um, uh, Dr. Hussein Abdul. Uh, doctor, uh, give us a sense of where we are right now in terms of um, uh, the last elections, what we did in 2019 elections, and what we did in Kogi and Bayasri election. Was that a bad outing for Nigeria? Well, I, I, I wouldn't say um, it's a bad outing for Nigeria. I am a student of politics, and, um, and I recognized um, the challenges for our political development as a country. Um, and and I, I think um, uh, the former Deputy Senate President did paint uh, a clear history of our politics, and we knew that the challenges have been quite enormous. Even when we returned to democracy in 1999, it had been quite a, a number of challenges involving elections. And that itself has to do with the nature and the, and, and the character of our politics, and with the kind of politics that we play in the country and the interest involved it's almost uh, impossible to, to actually have a kind of perfect elections that we all aspire to have. The changes we want to put in place as should actually be changes that doesn't only change electoral processes, that it also works to transform the political culture and institute a different system that is supportive of transparent elections. So I wouldn't say 2019 was bad, um, uh, we had our challenges, there were things that we need to improve on, and, and I think all the reports are very, are very, are very clear on, on it, um, um, depending on where you sit, but the reality actually is that there were progress made, but there were as well challenges, uh, and, and this is what you see uh, practically in every, in every election. Um, ordinarily, yes, we, we had wanted to have an election that is far, far better than what we had in 2019. Uh, but we wouldn't actually say that itself was totally flawed or, or, or extremely poor as sometimes presented. Kogi elections was a lot of questionable issues that actually emerged in that elections, uh, quite outrageous um, uh, and totally unacceptable particularly the, the behavior of, of, of many of our politicians, how and how processes were deeply undermined. I was there personally, I monitored the elections. I knew how it started, it started very strong, uh, quite well. And uh, by noon, uh, major disruptions began to emerge and we were very clear about those who um, contributed in undermining an, uh, an election that actually started neatly. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the first place. But what that goes to say for me is that whatever you put in place in Nigeria in terms of electoral safeguards, as long as the, 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 this culture remains, is that it will only last one election season uh, before the politicians get ways of undermining, of undermining it. And that's what we have seen increasingly. So anytime we had a major reform on the electoral process, the election that follows that happens to be very good, you, uh, at least relatively speaking, is good. Uh, but by the time you finish that one, you are getting to the next elections, people have perfected ways of actually manipulating the process or undermining the process, and then they, 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 they go out there to attack the next phase of your elections, and then you have a very bad or poor, or poor elections. And that's the context in which I try to compare probably what happened in 2015 and what happened in 2019 elections, is that people are beginning to perfect uh, the elections and trying to find out gaps within the system and go out there to undermine it. And that's what we want to see change. And that these changes, are, as much as we think that the processes must change, but we think it is very important that our politicians and the political culture in the country as well change. If we put all the process, all the brilliant systems in place, and our politicians remain the same, we can't sustain it. And so, so what, what we should be talking about is how do we transform this system, strengthen the process, and transform the political culture. That's the key thing. And citizens have a very important role to play in that regard. So as we are mobilizing and working with the National Assembly and we are working with INEC and the executive in getting the electoral laws changed, we should correspondingly be engaging the citizens because ultimately 
is the citizens that can actually contribute in changing the kind of culture that we have at the moment All right. Dr. that Abdul. is actually not yeah. suitable. So, Dr. For Abdul, just, the free just a moment. Trans and transparent election at the moment. You've touched on some very critical issues here, but I need to get back to uh, Professor Mahmoud and the uh, former Deputy Senate President, and I I'm going to give uh, each of them a minute to react quickly to some of these questions. Uh, Prof, uh, you as an electoral manager, election manager, uh, because there are a lot of uh, electoral amendments here and there that people were talking about. But for INEC, from your point of view, what would you say is the top three fixes that you're looking forward to? The top three. Well, um, <laughs> the first thing is actually what um, Dr. Amino Aldo mentioned, attitudinal change. But unfortunately, you cannot bring that about by legislation. You cannot legislate attitudinal change. And for as long as the attitude remains, irrespective of what laws we introduce, people will find ways of circumventing these laws. I would like a situation where we are consolidating on the gains of the past and incrementally improving our democracy. But what it means is that with every election, we have to introduce something new, like a joker. So that cat and mouse has continued. Uh, and so we are perpetually experimenting instead of consolidating for the reason that other panelists have mentioned. So I don't think that, that there are three issues that I need to mention, uh, but the essential thing is that you cannot bring about this change essentially by legislation. But the second thing is, when we legislate, let us legislate on the basis of principles. Why do you amend the electoral legal framework? We want to increase transparency of the electoral process. We want to increase greater participation of marginalized groups in elections. We want to strengthen the independence of the election management body. We want to reduce costs. We want to penalize electoral offenders. Unless you lay these principles out clearly, you can begin to pick and choose sections of the Electoral Act that we are going to amend. But I'm very happy that in uh, March this year, we had for the very first time a meeting in Lagos with the National Assembly. It has never happened before, where the commission met with the leadership of the National Assembly and the leadership of the two committees from, on, on INEC, from the House of Reps and the Senate. And we made a submission, uh, several areas of the Electoral Act to be amended, and we also laid the groundwork, the principles very clear um, before um, we proceed with the amendments. However, on the amendment to the electoral legal framework, and I'm happy that the former Deputy Senate President is here, where exactly where we are in July 2016, the Commission, I remember, made detailed submission. 34 areas of amendment to the Electoral Act, 25 to the Constitution, and we had a robust engagement with the 8th National Assembly. And I remember that in June or July 2016, we had a public hearing. And at that public hearing, we were assured, and the nation was assured and reassured, that by December 2016, there will be a brand new electoral act. But we were discussing and debating until around December 2018, just a few months to the 2019 general elections. So I hope we'll start early because we are not going to reinvent the wheel. There is nothing new to say that we don't know. All, right. All we need to do is to have the will to implement those beautiful ideas that we have. All right. So, Sean, maybe this is not the best time to say I'm going to itemize one or two or three <laughs> items. We all know what the issues are. Is that the courage to confront those challenges head on. And I believe that with the level of, of cooperation we have with the National Assembly, nothing is impossible. All right. And I hope that this time around, we'll have a brand new electoral act that incorporates all the suggestions made before. I wouldn't like to commit the Deputy Senate President of the National Assembly, but are we still committed to December 2020? Definitely, yes. Thank you. That's a very good uh, confirmation, uh, Deputy, uh, former Deputy Senate President. But I'll come back to you in just a moment, because you know what was a very touchy issue uh, in the last National Assembly, 8th National Assembly, was the sequence of election. We'll come back to that, because some people are asking for 
elections in one day. I will allow the Deputy Senate President to, to touch on that issue, but let me get well, one of our virtual uh, speakers to get on uh, is a Nigerian musician, Kobams Asukwa. Uh, let's get his view on what perhaps is on his mind as a Nigerian that is uh, so uh, devastating about our elections. Kobams, it's good to see you. Uh, what are your thoughts? What do you think is a major problem of our elections in terms of management of it? We can, we can. Go ahead, please. A significant number of Nigerians who uh, obviously contribute to the development of this country, but um, uh, by design and by, you know, the design of our electoral act have not been able to um, re exercise their, their civic responsibility as easily as everyone else. And um, I talk about persons living with disability, and we constitute a pretty significant number. And I think that, you know, this is a major concern for me as um, uh, you would imagine, because, uh, you know, just going through, you know, the, the Electoral Act, you see that um, in the areas where it is even mentioned, the, you know, where the interests of persons living with disability, you know, are represented, it's, uh, for one, it's, it's at best non-inclusive. It's not as inclusive. So, for instance, I make you know a particular reference to uh, Part Four. I think it is Section Fifty Six, Subsection One of the Electoral Act, and um, I think it talks about how it, the first issue is it refers to uh, you know blind persons and persons with physical deformities. It's um, it's not very extensive in terms of the scope you know and the spectrum of disabilities that Nigerians live with. And then it says something to the effect of, um, you, you know, a, a blind person may be accompanied by an assistant um, to um, vote, you know, which by itself is a challenge, especially when you consider as, as uh, you know, the sacred ballot system where um, I have the right to register, you know, my vote without, you know, the interference of another person. And uh, when you understand, you know, when you also take into consideration that, um, Technology also can play a very important role in um, in making this, you know, a lot easier to happen. I think the second thing also is, uh, in, I, I think, is in subsection two. It, it, it very loosely refer, it gives um, INEC the chance to uh, the, 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 the dictate how it wants to engage with persons living with disabilities. So, for instance, it says that INEC may, very loosely translated may, you know, take steps to. Um, alleviate whatever challenges persons living with disability, you know, might face in the course of voting. Now, I think the language may is a very, very, uh, it's not the most helpful way to communicate that sort of situation, because I think that, you know, it's the responsibility, you know, of INEC and of, you know, the rest of Nigeria to see that, you know, we're able to register suffrage appropriately. Um, you know, so, and I'm, I'm also aware that um, uh, Mr. Jake Ekbele, I think that's his name, and you most likely have him later on of the program. Uh, I'm aware that his organization, the Albino Foundation, has done you know, quite some extensive work in conjunction with IMEC to provide data for persons living with disability, which I imagine you know, would be able to you know, help answer some of these situations. So I just say all of this to say that inclusion is very important. And um, from personal experience, because I, I put off trips whenever it's time to vote, it's important to me to exercise my rights as a voter. And, you know, it's disheartening, you know, when I get there and I find out that for reasons such as this, you know, the interest is not, you know, well registered. So I think this is something um, I would like for us to speak to. I'm very happy also that uh, uh, the, the chairman of INEC made reference to implementation, because that's another thing. And it, it's interesting that we're having this conversation, but at the end of the day, what sees, um, to it that everything you know it happens to the letter and spirit is implementation is enforcement and you know i feel like that's a very 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 important right. issue and uh, yeah so that, that those those are my contributions i could go on and on but those are my contributions you have a very sweet voice and it's good to listen to cobams uh, uh but just uh, let's get because this is a town hall and we have a lot of people that are contributing uh, to these uh, let's get uh, members of the audience in our Buja studio uh, to contribute to these uh, we have um, Mufuliat Fijabi from our Abuja studio. Uh, Mufuliat, let's get your view just in uh, about 50 seconds on uh, the thoughts that have been shared today so that we get uh, some of the...
get it as to respond to it. Respond to it. Thank you very much. My contribution will come from the angle of uh, inclusion. Oftentimes, when we talk about elections in Nigeria, we want to look out for the credibility, the fairness, but we often do not talk about the inclusion part of it. Uh, when we talk about inclusion, we're referring to the marginalized groups in Nigeria, women, youth, persons with disabilities. I will focus more on women because um, it's very critical that our democratic process should be inclusive and should have good representation of women. Uh, in the electoral reform process, it is critical that issues of women are taken on board. For example, I would like to see an INEC that is tr truly independent and truly empowered to query political parties on why they fail to obey some of their own status, especially on affirmative action and inclusion of women. So we don't just want a, a kind of a jamboree kind of a political parties primaries with an equal playing ground for women, where most women are eliminated from that stage and where nobody is talking about why political parties Parties cannot ensure that they live truly to the mandate that right. uh, has Ms. established Fisher, them. Jabi, so we yeah. want a process that is even fairer in terms of ensuring that there is a gender balance and there is gender equality. Also, I'd like to um, so, emphasize uh, the fact let, that let me, the Ms. political Jabi, culture I, I just of wanted Nigeria one of your comments, one of it, uh, because of our time, so we can allow the uh, speakers to respond to it. But I will go back to our virtual space and let uh, members of the virtual audience to also participate. Uh, just about a few seconds to get your question in. Uh, I understand that Brenda is on the virtual uh, uh, space to get us a view on what is happening and perhaps ask a question. Brenda, uh, what are your view on uh, what is happening and what's your question? All right, Brenda on, on, on Zoom, is Brenda ready for us? All right, if, uh, let's, let's get, we'll get Brenda, we just want to get everybody that's thoughts. But in the, in the meantime, let me go back to uh, Abuja Studio and get Maji uh, Wilson uh, to get his view just in 40 seconds, Maji. For political actors, politics, um, elections are either free and f or unfree, are they fair or unfair, depending on whether you win elections or lose elections, you know, uh, depending on what side of the, uh, the table you, you stand. Uh, but of course, on, in terms of uh, election management, you know, and uh, technology, uh, I think um, it's also important for citizens to understand uh, the issues of uh, whether e-voting or the use of uh, deployment of uh, technology in elections. And of course, as the chair has rightly mentioned, uh, there has been incremental uh, introduction of uh, technology in our electoral processes. And of course, one of the major um, issues is to see that, of course, uh, integrity is uh, promoted within the process. But while doing that, um, I think it's important, uh, while legislating and ensuring that the Electoral Act is reviewed, that you look at certain issues of sustainability of uh, the technological uh, processes that will be put in place, uh, the adequacy of such technology, considering your infrastructural um, uh, schematics, you know, uh, the internet infrastructure in the country, the geography, uh, and also you have to also look at the cost effectiveness of such solutions, uh, the transparency of the procurement uh, processes, and also the timing of introducing such, you know, innovations is quite uh, important in ensuring that um, uh, the elections are conducted in, in, in a better way. All so right. I, I think these issues would further go a long way in ensuring that election management uh, is enhanced as the electoral laws are being revised at the moment. Thank you. Okay, great. So, uh, before, uh, because we're talking about the, uh, this segment on electoral management and technology, so quickly, I will say have my guests here. I understand that Bishop Kuka has since joined us also. Thank you so much, Bishop Kuka, for your time. Uh, but Let's go back uh, to the stage there in Abuja, and let's get the DSP, uh, former DSP, uh, Senator Ekweramadu, to get his thoughts, first and foremost to react to some of the issues people have raised uh, in the few minutes that we have for this segment. Can we have election in one day? Those, uh, that's one of the views people have raised tonight. 
Well, for me, I don't have a problem with that, but I'm sure the INEC chairman uh, will say that uh, there will be a lot of logistic issues, and I agree with him. Um, I think it's just not having, having an election in one day is not just uh, the issue. There are a number of fundamental issues, you know, that uh, we need to resolve. You know, the, uh, the INEC chairman has just said that, well, there are some of these things, uh, artisanal issues, you cannot legislate on. I agree with him, but I think we must have to make an effort. And make, making this effort, we need to draw example from other countries. We, one of the greatest problems we have is the issue of the uh, interference of incumbents in elections. You know, because when a president or a governor or a member of the National Assembly wants to come back to his position, so he's going to do a lot of things uh, that uh, will compromise the electoral management. So I pity the Indian Electoral Commission sometimes. The issue of uh, the order of elections, the time for elections, the Electoral Act all become very controversial especially when an incumbent is going to run an election. And that's why some of us in the past have mooted the idea of looking at a single term of office. You know, so this is exactly what happened in the Latin America. Most of them decided to do single term, at least for a transition period, some 20 years, some 30 years. I believe it's only Mexico that's still practicing now. You do one term of office and then we leave. Because if you're an incumbent and the Electoral Act is being discussed, an amendment to the Constitution regarding the Electoral matter is being discussed, you must show more than a personal interest. And that's exactly what the problem we've been having. You know, so we need to look at that uh, uh, aspect. And again, uh, the uh, issue raised my sister, my sister about uh, the representation of women and um, uh, the youth. I quite agree with them. This issue has been on for a long, long time. And when the young people, uh, Todo, came to us uh, when we were doing the last uh, uh, constitutional amendment in the 8th Assembly, we were talking about youth inclusiveness. We agreed with them, so okay, we reduced the age limit. But I warned them that it was not going to solve their problem. And of course, I'm not sure it has solved their problem. You know, because what has happened in most jurisdictions is not uh, uh, they're not too young to run. No. What they've done is what they call proportional representation. This is what has worked for South Africa, it has worked for uh, East Africa countries, it has worked for the Nordics. And that's why in these countries you see a number of women in their parliament. They don't contest the election as individuals. What happened is proportional representation. So each party is located is based on the, the percentage of the vote right. you, uh, you get and the elections. Sen Sen and Sen those votes are allocated to young people, to women and all that. All right. So when you do that, they can, can see inclusiveness and all that. Sen as long as everybody is going to run an election. In, so we're going to continue to have issue of uh, lack of representation of women. So that's another thing we need to look at. So we'll get a, a robust uh, representation uh, on the conversation tonight. I understand that uh, uh, Mr. Muiz Banere, former commissioner in Lagos and a former legal advisor of the APC, is, in, uh, is a member of our virtual audience. And he, ha uh, he has a question. Mr. Banere. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I don't have a question. I have a comment, and I don't know whether you are able to accommodate me. Mr. Banner, Hello, please go ahead with your question. Yes, I said I have a, I have comment, not question, please. And I don't know whether comments are accommodated. Can I go ahead with my comment? Please go ahead, Mr. Banner. Thank you very much. Let me start by saying that the issue we are engaging in today, uh, although not too late, but it's getting late already because it takes time, like you have demonstrated earlier, to accomplish most of these uh, points that are being made. And again, it must be a continuous engagement because we have a long way to go and there are too many issues. But let me quickly go on first and foremost that there is a factor that you have not been discussing, the attraction of public offices. That is where the problem starts from. We have to de-emphasize the attraction in those offices. We have to make it less attractive. Once it's still attractive as it is now, people are ready to go to any land and are always that way to go to any land. That's number one. Number two, again, is the fact that Civic education and enlightenment is very poor, it's weak. If it is INEC, but I know INEC cannot do it alone, we need to engage the civil society also to ensure that the people are able to connect their food to their life. People don't appreciate as at now the network between their life and their vote. That's why they still see it as a merchandise, as, as a product that they sell regularly. Thirdly, I believe also that as of today, the issue of electoral petition, the reality of the matter as the law stands today and the processes is that you hardly can win any electoral petition as a petitioner in Nigeria. The law is so shrewd against the petitioner that you can hardly can survive. So you are looking for electoral justice. The electoral jurisprudence is not that favorable today at all, and we need to look at that. 
The question of violence and toggling scares a lot of people and is a contributing factor to apathy. A lot of people will tell you, I don't want to go out there, I can't endanger my life. The security ideas are never on top of security issues during election. That is the reality. So I'm glad that the INEC chairman is toying with the idea of a, by electronic balloting. That will go a long way in assisting us and improving the, uh, uh, the voters' participation in the election. Again, right. we have weakness in the internal democracy. The monitoring is equally weak. Of party congresses and party primaries is very, very weak. We need to look at that also. And uh, uh, the issue of qualification, maybe I need my half to be reinvested with that power to disqualify some of these countries subject to court uh, 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 supervising INEC. But right. the situation now where there is nothing like that, it does not occur well for the system. I thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Abanera, thank you so much. Let's stay with that uh, platform and let's get Fuluke Ademokun. I see that she's uh, raising her, her hand to, uh, to get a question across. Fuluke, we are hearing you now. For look at All right. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, yeah, go can ahead, you hear Fuluke. me now? You 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 yeah. have about forty seconds for your thoughts. <laughs> okay, I just want to you know uh, uh, let us you know focus also on civic education, like as it has been mentioned. We need to expand the process of voters' education so that the citizens can just not you know look at uh, party logos. They should also know about issues. What issues are they voting for? So that our campaign can be issue based and we can focus as citizens on, on the manifestos of the political parties. That's just what I want to add. All right. Thank you so much uh, for looking for your thoughts there. Uh, let's come back uh, to Lagos here, and I'll get one of my uh, uh, panelists uh, in Lagos, uh, the woman that is always campaigning for enough is enough. We have the INEC chairman right there, and we're trying to fix some of these uh, issues. Before I go and get the views and round of this session, uh, Yemi, what do you think is a major problem in terms of management of our elections that need to be looked at? Just one thing. Well, I'll tie it with what the chairman said. Um, technology is a tool. If the people who are managing the process are not committed to a process that's free, fair, inclusive, and at this point, safe, then we won't get far. And I'll use two quick examples. One, we have members of the National Assembly who are in jail but are still collecting their salaries. Now, that level of sort of communication of impunity doesn't send a, a good message around paying for a crime, if I want to use that word. And then today, we saw the governor of Undo State, who was coughing in his hand at a public rally, not wearing a mask, and now he's positive with COVID-19. So if we have elected officials who are blatantly flouting rules or who end up in jail and are getting paid to be in jail, then technology or the use of technology or some of the things we want to do to improve our um, elections will have a problem. Great. So in rounding up these... Uh session, uh, because we still have issues relating to political parties of us and uh, how we can fix the issue of uh, security in election. I will uh, go to um, um, uh, the representative of uh, the Deputy Senate President, uh, Mr. Malala, there, and get a final thought on the program uh, tonight on what you'll be taking home from what people have said and the confidence that people should have in the process that your principal, uh, the Deputy Senate President, is su uh, superintending. Thank you, Sheo. Um, essentially, what I would like us to think about is that we're in the process of working on enhancing the sanctity of the vote of each voter in Nigeria. You know, we're trying to make the system more transparent. We're trying to make the system more accountable. We're trying to uh, introduce new innovations that will reduce paper trails um, um, that also warrant or enhance technological innovations in the process of the elections. We're talking about uh, um, electronic balloting, like the chairman has said, where we should be distinguished from e-voting, the way we think about uh, e-commerce and all of that. So we're looking at those things. We're looking at, especially at this time, how, these, um, how we're going to have safe elections. We're looking at the petrol of issues. We're looking at the issues of inclusion of women and youth. We're looking at um, reducing the cost, you know, of participation at the level of political parties. A lot of issues are together in, the, in these bills that we're seeking to harmonize to cause a repeal 
of the extant uh, uh, electoral act. Well, I speak for my principal, and this is the extent of the work we've done. I'm not competent to speak for the institution of the National Assembly, but the distinguished senator has mentioned that the institution of the National Assembly is committed to getting the bill or the electoral act delivered by December this year. We are hopeful, you know, that this is accomplished because this is the time to get these reforms done so that we can have free, transparent, credible, and, um, and um, you know, fair elections, you know, so that the whole system, you know, the comprehensive and complex whole will be better for it and our democracy will be better for it. Uh, That's thank, my take. Thank you so much, Mabel, for, for your thoughts. Let me get uh, Dr. Abdul uh, a quick uh, uh, final thought from you, Dr. Abdul. Uh, we have these uh, myriads of uh, amendments to the bills. For you, do you think that we need a lot of all of these amendments, or we should just stick to just a few and get things done? Yeah, I, I, I think if we're going to amend, I think we should amend all the key issues, learning from the experiences of our past elections and the reports that we have available that actually examine uh, the challenges of our elections. For me, the commitment to, this, to uh, December, e, e, on December is the key. Uh, because we have seen this historically, as long as the amendment process gets very close to elections, it becomes very contentious, and those contentions never allow for anything to pass. And the experience of the last amendment process uh, is quite clear there. And that's why we, we think that uh, the parliament should do everything possible to ensure that we deliver in, in, in December. But in doing that as well is to also make sure that we engage the different segments of the country, uh, the civil society, the women's groups, the people living with disability, and all those key platforms, including politi politicians and political parties, to ensure that we collectively have an electoral law uh, that will serve the purpose for which we are all committed to, which is free, credible, and transparent elections in Nigeria. Dr. Abdul, thank you so much indeed. Uh, let's get a final word from uh, Senator A.K. Ekweramadu on this uh, management. Can Nigerians uh, go home tonight, Senator, believing that you and your colleagues are going to ensure that on time and effectively we will have an electoral law that we can all be proud of? Senator. Yes, uh, before now, we thought we uh, would have had something to present to Mr. President for his assent, except for the COVID-19 intervention. So we believe that uh, as soon as possible, we're going to get this in behind us, because we want this, the public to participate in the public hearing. That's the only thing that might delay the process. But uh, with the uh, issue of the protocol, new protocols of managing issues now with the COVID-19, I'm sure that we'll find a way around it so that the public will now make their input for our own consideration before we send to the president for assent. So with that in mind, I believe that as we assured the INEC in our meeting in Lagos before or on, by on or before December 2020, we'll be able to have an electoral act for Nigeria. But let me also say that this COVID-19 have changed the ways of doing things. So it's even good enough that I've not been able to pass that act before now. So with the COVID-19, it will give INEC an opportunity and even the general public to come up with new ideas, you know, of uh, managing elections with uh, the new protocols. You know, so it is very, very critical. Today, earlier today, I participated in the climate uh, parliament dealing with uh, the um, post-COVID-19 transportation sector, uh, transportation. So I believe that both sectors need to begin to think out of the box on how to manage certain sectors uh, in post-COVID-19. And electoral management is one key area that they need to think through so that they form part of the new electoral act that's coming up in terms of the campaign, in terms of the uh, voting, and also conduct of uh, post-election issues. So these are the things I think that the opportunity has come for all of us to think out of the box and be able to make sufficient input, both from the civil society and uh, the uh, electoral management body, that will be able to enhance the quality of the electoral act that will come, up the na come out of the National Assembly. The truth is that somebody who is a voter today will be a candidate tomorrow. So everybody should be interested in what the electoral act looks like. Former Deputy Senate President Ike Ekweramadu, thank you so much for your thought there, uh, Senator. Uh, we will switch to a, a new segment on the visa program, and it's going to be about party politics, candidate nomination process, and campaign financing. But I must sincerely thank also Dr. Abdul and Mita Mabel Amalalad, representative of the Deputy Senate, uh, Deputy Senate, Senate President uh, Ovie Omoagege. But the INEC chairman is going to stick with us, but we will. Uh, 
uh, get in some other panelists from our Abuja studio. But let me introduce some of the panelists that we already have uh, for uh, our next segment. Uh, I can see. Uh, so let me also thank uh, Kobans Asukwa. Thank you so, uh, so much, uh, Kobans, for your thoughts there. Uh, we have already for this new segment um, Bishop Matthew Kuka. Thank you so much indeed for joining us tonight, and it's good to see you, uh, Bishop. And uh, we also have uh, Omoni Oboli, uh, and a Nigerian actor. Thank you so much for coming. And Professor Ebun Shonaya, a former presidential candidate. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof, for your time. Perhaps we should begin, and uh, let's get uh, bishops uh, 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 to give us a, a, a head start uh, on this one. Party politics, candidate nomination process, and campaign financing. First and foremost, we saw a lot of um, court cases, uh, basically uh, from court of coordinate jurisdiction, uh, given uh, similar uh, orders on uh, party affairs. First and foremost, a lot of people will say that that's exactly where the problem of our politics is starting from where political parties cannot manage their internal affairs. Bishop, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you very much, Shoin, Shoin for having me, and I want to commend you and commend Yaga for this initiative. I think it's spectacular, and the conversations have been wonderful. Uh, let me repeat what I have always said consistently, that uh, we are mistaken in assuming that we've had a transition from dictatorship to democracy. We still haven't. And this is why we are showing all kinds of systemic malfunctioning. Uh, when we talk about political parties, we have assumptions. But the truth of the matter is that in our own case in Nigeria, we have the, we, 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 we have the greed and the political interest for the, the parties. And that um, clearly what we have in Nigeria, as we have seen with the occasional malfunctioning of the systems uh, midway through the journeys uh, manifested in the quarrelsomeness nature of politics and the, the, the way that the judiciary now has to now come to undermine, let me put it that way, the wishes of the people, its intrusive occupation of the public space. Uh, so just very clearly that increasingly, you know, we, we have very serious issues with party discipline, largely because um, what we call political parties in Nigeria are mere contraptions purely constructed to, to, to help to ferry the ambitions of, of, of people, a good number of who are really, really and truly ill-prepared for the discipline that politics and political party formations require. So what you are seeing uh, is the lack of consistency and continuation. Um, we, are, we keep talking, for, for example, about the fact that we've had 20 or so years interrupted democracy, but we also must have the nature of the of the of the political actors, the changing patterns of, on the political landscape. All these things suggest very clearly that we can number the years of our effort, but that has not injected the kind of discipline and predisposition that we require, you know, for politics and active political participation. You have a high percentage of uh, party office holder um, turnover at the national assembly at the state levels. Uh, so our system is so quarrelsome, largely because, as I said, we, 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 we have come from a military background. We never had a, a clinical transition, uh, as I said, beginning from, from, from you know, our history. Every time, it's always been the military purely and simply putting together a contraption to enable uh, you know, people ferry their ambition through to the system. So these are some of the difficulties. Of course, when you talk about the judicial Increasingly, we are finding now that the integrity of the judiciary is coming under question, just like any other institution that, that gets sucked into politics. Uh, so uh, it is to say that uh, going forward, two quick things. The first is for us to pay more attention to the future. That is why this conversation is very important, that a new generation of Nigerians with a different view about our country, with a different set of skills and different sets of discipline must begin to see politics in a much more noble form, beyond just the contestation that we are facing for, you know, we are seeing, you know, for all power. The second point is for the judiciary itself to begin to think more in focusing on compelling politics and politicians 
to fine tune their, their, their articles of discipline internally, uh, rather than the judiciary getting sucked into uh, the whole idea of, uh, of them being the final adjudicators you know, to the wishes of the people. Because increasingly what we're going to have in the future is a, a judiciary that is highly politicized, a judiciary whose integrity continues to come on, you know, into question, and a, a judiciary whose energies are sucked into politics, you know, and not defined, defined principles of interpreting the laws in other areas. So, but I just, again, I want to conclude by saying, I think it would be nice if we focus more on a, on a young generation of Nigerians uh, who begin to find ways of avoiding the horrible mistakes that we are finding, you know, in the name of politics in Nigeria, i.e., the insatiable greed, you know, the, the indiscipline, uh, the, the, the zero sum game, this, you know, attitude and disposition, the, look, the view of politics not as service but a, a vehicle for ambition. And of course, finally, it is to make the point that our sorrows continue to increase because very little, if anything, has always changed in the lives of ordinary Nigerians. So we have had 20 years, but none of those 20 years have suggested that there has been a visible increase in improvement in the quality of lives of Nigerians in the area of social services, in the areas of health, in the areas of education. So we just have a few cowboys coming in and going out, doing well for themselves. And this is why you still find that Nigerian politics is for a long time going to remain very, very violent and very, very quarrelsome. But like I said, we can avoid these pitfalls by focusing more on raising a new generation of Nigerians with higher ideals, you know, of the principles of nobility, you know, for public service. Thank you, uh, Bishop. Uh my lord, uh, getting us started uh, gets uh, uh, the conversation about inclusion. Th there is um, another person whom I'm going to also call on on the virtual space. But before I do that, let me introduce our new set of panelists from our Buja studio. Uh, I have there the Attorney General of the Federation and the Minister of Justice, uh, Mr. Abubakar Malami, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, thank you so much, AGF, for coming tonight on this town hall. And the Chairman, Senate Committee on Judiciary, and a member of the uh, Senate Committee on INEC, Senator Opayami Bamdele, thank you so much, Senator, for coming tonight. And we have uh, the National Chairman of ADP, Alaji Yabagi Sani. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, for coming tonight. And we, uh, of course, have Mr. Ezenwa Mwagu. He's uh, the Executive Director of Partners for Electoral Reforms. Thank you, Mr. Mwagu. Of course, the INEC Chairman is still with us tonight. Let me get Amonio Boli uh, to Professor uh, Ebunshonaya is also with us, a former presidential candidate. Uh, yourself and uh, Amoni, I'm going to get your quick reaction on inclusion. But Amoni, uh, you made a movie, uh, you were in a movie that basically talks about women contesting for office. Uh, what are your thoughts or are you disappointed so far about women participation in politics and in elective roles in Nigeria? All right, great. So my mic is unmuted now. Mm. Hi, Sheon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Um, so I made a movie called Love is War, right? It's about um, a couple who end up vying for the same political position. Don't tell me. Don't, don't ask me how they got there. So one of the things I've realized, apart from the obvious patriarchal society that we live in in Nigeria, is that a lot of women... Um, in politics are married into other tribes. So what ends up happening most times is your state won't give you their ticket because they won't give you their endorsement, obviously, because you're married to a man from another tribe or from another state. And of course, your husband's state are going to say definitely not. Why would we give our ticket to a woman from another state? I mean, I'm talking even in the same state, for instance, I'm Urobo from Delta State, right? And um, I'm, my husband is from Anioma, the Anioma part of Delta State. He's from Ubuzo, right? If I were to run for office in Delta State, I'm sure they would tell me something like, oh, you know, 
Um, this time around, it's, it's the turn of the Anyomas. So, you know, you're from Delta State. We're not going to give it to you. And then I'll say, oh, but my husband is from Anyoma. And it's like, oh, the Anyoma people want a woman from Anyoma or someone from Anyoma. You know, so women have been greatly marginalized. It's very disappointing, completely disappointing that even till now, we don't have women in, in big positions. It's, it's not on merit. Women are mostly um, given appointments. They're not, they're not elected into office. You know, and then when it comes to financing, for instance, a lot of women don't even bother to come out because they know they're not going to have the finances to go through with it. Because most of the people that are financing politics are men. And they're going to pretty much finance the people they think would win because they don't want to back a losing horse. You know, so, so that, these are the problems that women are facing when it comes to politics. You know, um, one of the other things that um, it's, it's, it's a major problem is that a lot of women feel like politics is dirty. And the truth is we have seen that politics in Nigeria is actually quite dirty, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say. You know, so a lot of women don't want the stress of going through um, dirty politics. You know, they would rather just, you know, be away from it and not have to face that. So I feel like men feel like, oh, they have more of um, stamina to go through with something like that, you know? So it's, it's a vicious circle. I think if we can see that our electoral process is free, is fair, is inclusive, it's safe, more women would come out. More women will, will want to, you know, to get into in politics. But right now, because of the way it is, a lot of women are shying away. And even the women that come out, they're not being supported. All right. You know, so, so that, that's the problem that we're facing as women. Thank you, Amoni, for your thoughts there. Stay with us. Let me go to our Abuja studio. Um, I know Professor Ebusunaya is also there. I'll come back to that uh, space in a moment. Uh, let's get it round. And uh, in our Abuja studio, let's speak with um, the Attorney General of the Federation. The President, why, uh, when he took the mantle of village leadership when uh, he got into office in 2015, one of the things that he said is that he's going to be cute on Nigeria a good electoral system and a good election. He did also renew that commitment uh, after he won a re-election, and he said he's going to leave Nigeria with a good electoral system. Uh, AGF, uh, Honorable Minister, do you think we have the kind of electoral law that Nigeria deserves? Well, um... The question, or perhaps the major consideration relating to electoral system, is indeed a consideration of where we were as at 1999 and then where we are today. It is indeed a system that has been positively evolving, positively developing. How do I mean? If you look at the legislative process, for example, for that matter, Originally, as at 1999, we started at a footing, electorally, where the whole system was chaotic, the whole system was unpredictable, legislatively and otherwise. But arising from the evolution, arising from the appreciation of the developments that are setting in, we come to understand that there is need for collective cooperative action involving the judiciary, the legislature, and indeed the executive. Let us take one single element relating to the evolution of electoral process. For example, the issue relating to perhaps uh, pre-election matters determination. We all very well know that uh, as at 1999, free election matters were pending in court for close to seven to ten years in respect of a tenure that is intended and expected to terminate within a period of ten years. As at last year, we have pending before the Supreme Court cases that were uh, pre-election matters cases that were pending for over six, seven years through the process of judicial determination. Now, how does the collective and cooperative action now provide a solution to that uh, problem that set into the system. The judiciary, the executive, the legislature, sorry, for that matter, came in with a legal framework 
that now take time within which, by way of constitutional amendment, within which pre-election matters were expected to be concluded. So how does the co uh, collaborative action now assisted further the due determination of pre-election matters as at when due? The judiciary kept firm with the time stipulated, legislatively stipulated, and ensured at the end of the day that pre-election matters are concluded within the statutory regulated time. So taking that into consideration, it is indeed apparent that the electoral process is indeed evolving. But that does not mean to say that there are no rooms for further improvement. And I think collectively and collaboratively, we are trying as much as possible to enhance on the quality of the system by way of empowering INEC, by way of building capacity, by, by way of ensuring at the end of the day that necessary compliances required for the purpose of bringing about sanity, right. bringing about transparency, Honorable Minister. and bringing about accountability as it relates to electoral process are brought to bear by way of either a legal framework, judicial determination, or executive intervention. All so right. I think so taking into consideration where we were, uh, as at 1999, and where we are today, with particular reference to new developments that set into the process, I think we have a great story to tell as far as the dem democratic dispensation is concerned. All right, let's, so, let's go for a break. But we will further assess what is happening to the political party space, issues of candidate nomination and the campaign financing. We'll get the Attorney General of the Federation to talk more and other panelists when we come back from the break, everyone. Don't go anywhere. Keep tweeting, keep participating. Our elections must be fixed. Thank you so much, everyone, and welcome back to our Fixing Nigeria Election, a Citizen Tower All program, Radio on Channels Television, put together by Yaga and its partners, the European Union, EKES, and of course, Channels Television at the center of it all. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us. Let me get back quickly. Before I get the other panelists right on this hybrid production uh, to get into the conversation, let me get uh, the Attorney General of the Federation to talk earlier before you arrived on the scene uh, there was a, a, a poser that we've not had a single executive bill from the executive arm of government to the National Assembly as regarding uh, issues of electoral reforms is the president and the Buhari government committed to fixing our election honorable minister well I think for the purpose of um fixing our election and electoral system, the major attribute for consideration is the independence and indeed sustenance of the independence of INEC as an electoral body in terms of effective discharge of its duties and responsibility as an umpire within the context of the electoral process. Now, the issue is for the first time in the history of Nigeria and the history, electoral history of Nigeria as a nation, the decisions of INEC have been wholeheartedly indeed complied with by the executive. That in its own right, a situation whereby, for example, a candidate of a ruling party is indeed perhaps disqualified on account of non-compliance with the constitution of the party or electoral process, I think it's a great plus to the, I mean, to the credit of a ruling party. We are all living witnesses to what happened in Zampara, for example. We are all living witnesses that as at today, INEC as an umpire reserve exclusive right to determine constitutional compliance of a political party in terms of fielding a candidate for that matter. For the first time as well, judiciary is equally accorded the desired independence in terms of judicial determination of cases that are associated with, poli with political process and indeed that are electorally based. We are living witnesses again 
as to what happened relating to the elect governorship election in Zamfara, a situation whereby the entire, uh, the, the entire process, inclusive of that of governorship, senators, and in fact, the, and indeed, the State House of Assembly, where the, uh, a decision was given, was, end, was uh, delivered indeed by judiciary against the ruling party, and it wholeheartedly accepted the decision in good faith. And there are a lot of other cases prevailing in the system by which the independence of INEC is indeed established by way of taking decision that is majorly adverse to the interest of the ruling party. So in essence, within the context of establishing the independence of INEC as an umpire in the electoral process, the independence of judiciary in the determination of cases with electoral undertones, I think it is only fair, uh, it, I mean, the conclusion is justified that indeed as a government, we are indeed uh, compliant, we, ha we have indeed supported the evolution and development of electoral process and have done enough for the purpose of enhancing it. And again, it is not correct to conclude that um, uh, this administration has not indeed supported the evolution of the electoral process. One, you should know the function of the executive is not the development of electoral bill, but then ensuring at the end of the day, those legislations, those laws and uh, provisions of the law that are put in place are indeed affected, are, are, are indeed implemented effectively for the purpose of sustaining the development of electoral process. All right, honorable so, minister. Uh, within that context, yeah. uh, the uh, constitutional amendment relating to the fixing of the time within which election matters should be concluded was assented to by the president. So we have indeed supported a collaborative action that will see to the advancement of the judiciary. So the question is not the existence or otherwise of an executive bill, but whether indeed the executive has done enough for the purpose of enhancing the evolution of electoral process within the context of assenting to laws that will now enhance the quality of delivery of the electoral process within the context of indeed ensuring the independence of INEC and indeed the judiciary for the purpose of ensuring at the end of the day that right. due consideration, due compliance is given to uh, the associated electoral laws. And uh, within that context, I think we have indeed, as an executive, uh, supported the process, the evolution and development of electoral system and process. All right. Let's get a voice of opposition into the conversation. And let me bring in uh, Alagi Yabaji Sani. is a national chairman of the ADP. Alagi Sani, uh, with what we, uh, what we are seeing so far on, uh, on the political scene in Nigeria, uh, how would you uh, assess uh, political party participation, the issues of uh, campaign financing, is it fair enough for what the Electoral Act uh, recommends? Uh, thank you, Sean. I think it's an important uh, uh, conversation we are having here, but I'm, I'm a little bit disturbed by the submission of the Attorney uh, General of Federation, because what he described, I think they are the obvious things that the President is expected to do. He swore to, to protect the constitution of this country and to do what he did is what he's expected to do. Are we to clap for him that he's doing what he's, he's, he's elected to do? No. So I think we're under what I would describe like a state capture by the executive that we have in the position to, in, in the government today. Because I remember what happened in Koji, you know, when the president approved 10 billion naira on the eve of an election and you are saying that you are promoting free and fair election, you know, against others that do not have any access to such, 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 such kind of money, and this is this about the state resources. So I think we have to be fair to, 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 to this country that we have a top to bottom problem in this country, not only in the election matter, but also other matters. And until we, we sort out the problem of the top, which is the people who are controlling the government. And in this case, in fact, even the National Assembly itself, you know, cannot be absorbed from the blame here. Because why did they approve that amount of money that went to Koji State? 
at that point in time. Why did the National Assembly not pass a law or invoke a kind of uh, punishment, some kind of sanction against the executive when the executive refused to accent to the bill, which the National Assembly sent to the executive on so many occasions to guarantee an environment that will produce free and fair elections. We remember that uh, there's, there was a president in this country that two weeks, two to three weeks for the election, he approved an amendment to the election which brought in this government that we are talking about today, which is the use of smart, smart card readers. So if a president can approve amendment to the electoral bill, two weeks to the elections, and you send a, a bill to, to a, a president so many times and, and it will stand back to you, there must be something that is wrong. So I think we have to be very serious about right. how... So we regard the people of this country. We are right. not maroons. You so, know, we uh, know what we are doing. All right. I like you it's, it's high time that people in government wake up and rise to the occasion and take, take the right steps so that we guarantee free and fair elections. Because it's very important to, to the survival of, the, of this country. If we cannot guarantee free and fair elections, believe you me, we have a big problem going forward. All right. So, I, and you, you asked a question as, as to whether the financing of the elections, that's why I'm telling you about what happened in Koji State. You know, because how do you, how do, how do you, how do you, how do you expect to have a, a, a level playing ground when such things are happening by the executive? So I, I think there's no, there's, let, no, let me, there's for, no free and fair election. So, and, and, and I commend the, 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 the INEC, the, I commend the INEC for, for promoting the establishment or, or, or the, uh, the National Assembly, the establishment of the National Electoral Practices Commission. But before then, before that, offenses are committed because the grand norms are so loose. You know, if you don't have the grand norms that will protect, that will prevent, they say prevention is better than cure. So why not concentrate on introducing and promoting things that will guarantee free and fair election by, by way of having electronic systems in, the, in, 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 our, in our conduct of the elections and then having the executive to buy into that. So, but I'm happy and I, I thank God that the president today is a lame duck, is a lame duck president. He doesn't have any collateral interest in what is happening, what is going to happen in 2023. So I expect him to write his name in gold by quickly as, as giving accent to the, to the bill, which we are told that by December, of this year, it will get to the, uh, the, the National Assembly will give us an electoral bill that will be able to guarantee right. free and fair election. So, Alaji Abaji, let me, let me get uh, Professor Remy uh, Shonaya into, uh, that's another uh, voice of uh, opposition in the, in the room here, uh, a former presidential candidate. Uh, Professor, you ran for office, and uh, from what you saw, were you disgusted? Because I saw some of your tweets, at that time about the way things went in COA and at the end of the day, how the election went. Do you have your frustration and what were there? Uh, thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, no, I'm not frustrated uh, in any way, certainly not uh, about COA party. Uh, if I am frustrated at all, it is, uh, about what I see happening in the polity as a whole, or uh, specifically in the two frontline parties. Because the question we must ask is, what is the purpose of our elections? You know, I certainly do not uh, share in this congr self-congratulatory attitude um, of people saying, oh, we've come a long way, we've made a lot of progress, and so on. If you are even improving on the running of the elections, on the conduct, the process of uh, conducting your elections, what the lives of the people that for whom you are uh, supposed to be working, their lives do not show any improvement whatsoever. Nigeria has become the poverty capital of the world. And now you come and congratulate yourself that you are, you know, things are getting better, or we are improving and so on. I, 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 I cannot share in, in, in that. 
I do not understand it. You know, we see what's currently happening in, in, in Ondo State, in uh, Edo State. So it is clear that the whole intent of the people who are involved is not at all about service to the generality of Nigerians. You know, so that is what frustrates me, if you can talk about frustration at all. And I think that it is time for Nigerians as citizens to rise up now and begin to demand fundamental changes in a radical manner, if I may add. People are advocating for you know, constitutional reforms, electoral reforms. I personally, I would like to put this in right now. I personally would like to see a unicameral legislature. Um, I know that it's a, you know, uh, it's going to be difficult. But I think that we, we must begin to say the things that need to be said. Nigeria does not have the kind of money to waste that we are wasting. Why should our elections cost so much? Universities don't have that, the kind of money that we're spending on elections to conduct research. Here we are in the midst of a pandemic. How much money is going to the universities for research, for education? Many of our students are uh, blocked, locked down at home. A few are able to transit to online teaching and so on. But the majority, especially in the public institutions, are not able to do anything. All right, it Prof, let, let's bring in, yeah, okay. So let, yeah, let, let, let me quickly. clear what we need to spend our money on. Okay. It's very clear. And uh, we don't have much of it. So we better begin to, to redefine our priorities. Money right. should not be going so much to uh, conducting elections and, and paying National Assembly members. All right. I see uh, uh, Dr. Akinbolu here, uh, but in the Abuja studio, let me bring in uh, Senator Okwemi Bamdele. He's the chairman of the Committee on Judiciary uh, at the Senate and also a member of the INEC committee. Senator, it's good to see you again, but let me ask you, are you worried about what we have seen, especially as regarding political party affairs, when we see uh, them taking these cases and these issues to the doorstep of the judiciary, and we see them uh, window shopping court orders, you over uh, sight on the judiciary. Is that a big concern for you? Well, uh, thank you, Sheo. I would begin by saying that uh, really I'm not worried, but I'm concerned. Uh, I'm not worried because going to court is actually a part and parcel of the democratic process in any civilized society. And as far as uh, I'm concerned, there's actually no alternative to that. The only alternative to that is anarchy. Um, and that's why it's important that the integrity of the judiciary itself, uh, as well as the integrity of our electoral process, uh, must be something that we all must, must continue to clamor for. Uh, but as for people going to court, uh, it's really nothing uh, inimical to the growth of our democracy. Uh, but what is important is also for the various political parties and political gladiators to respect the laws, both of the land as well as the laws as provided for in the respective constitutions of their various political parties. If, for instance, your party constitution says before you go to court to institute a suit, you must avail yourself with internal conflict resolution mechanism within the party before your case or your matter becomes ripe for adjudication. I think it's important that political graduators uh, avail themselves of that opportunity first. Um, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, some of the things that happened um, in my own party recently 
um, will, will go to ascertain or, or to, or to um, you know, buttress the fact that a lot of people will rather than sit down uh, and talk about things internally within the party, want to make the court of law, you know, their first uh, uh, place of call. And as far as I'm concerned, the decision taken by the leadership of the party and, and not regardless of what anybody will say, I mean, there are as many opinions as there are people. You never will get the same uh, opinion. Uh, but that decision a few days ago saved judiciary from a, a potential embarrassment and loss of integrity, uh, which, which could have been better prevented or protected if people would respect the constitution of their own party. But uh, basically, I just want to emphasize that uh, the, the court process uh, will continue to be there for uh, politicians or political gladiators but, like but, uh, other members of yeah, uh, the Senator, various other sectors Senator, the Nigerian society uh, Senator, to explore. What, what, what a lot of people have big holes at uh, is uh, the court of coordinate jurisdiction giving similar orders or different orders on a uh, particular matter. As a lawyer and as the chair of the Judiciary Committee, that is what a lot of people are saying and asking, are you concerned about that and what are you probably going to do so we don't see these kind of things happen again? Well, uh, Sheung, what is going on here right now is a part of the process of trying to ensure that uh, it's not business as usual. And it's also trying to ensure that, uh, again, it's not going to be a highway to nowhere. Uh, the, the town hall meeting that is going on uh, is also further providing a platform for stakeholders from the various sectors uh, to come together. Uh, a lot had been said about attempts, you know, before now to really pass the electoral uh, bill into law, the amendment bill into law. And I know part of the reasons it did not work were because enough work was not done to bring stakeholders together. Um, those who would say executive uh, arm of government never initiated an electoral bill, my own response to that would be that they didn't have to. It could have, it could have come from any sector, either from within the political class or from INEC itself or from uh, the civil society. Or, I mean, it will come as a private member bill on the floor of the parliament. The reason we have a parliament anywhere in the world is because laws will always need to be amended based on day-to-day -day realities of our situations. Otherwise, we don't even need a parliament. So, uh, and before... It is not necessarily yeah. for the executive right. to bring, to sponsor an executive bill. Senator, but when there's a bill on the floor of the House, again, there's a procedure that will ensure an inclusive uh, uh, participation on the part of various stakeholders. The electoral uh, amendment bill that we're talking about, trying to, to pass into law now for the uh, third time, will soon be coming up for public hearing. And it will be another opportunity for Nigerians to come together, different stakeholders to come together and discuss this. But I've seen today an INEC that is so desirous of trying to ensure that it is not going to be business as usual. They have demonstrated enough seriousness. They have, of course, exhibited integrity. But you see, uh, they also need the relevant laws that they need to be armed with as they take their day-to-day -day decisions. Part of the reason Mr. President refused to sign the electoral amendment bill uh, was because some clauses within the Constitution, for instance, were deemed to have taken over the duties of INEC with respect to the constitutional authority of INEC to determine the date and venue for our elections. And I mean, if our president, I wouldn't sign that. Because right. I say no. S Senator, uh, we, we are due for a break. You know, with, with yeah, the Senator Bamdele, we are due for uh, a break. So, so apologies to Bartin. We are due for a break. But uh, people are asking me here to ask you if just, I just need a nod or a yes or a no, are you committed to ensuring that the committee will end its work by December 2020? Well, uh, so my answer will be in the positive, uh, but it's not something that you can just reduce to a yes or no. Uh, passing the electoral bill, the electoral amendment bill, uh, was one of the priorities we set for ourselves for this year, and we remain committed to that. 
Uh, but of course, there were some other things we also committed ourselves to. For instance, including passing the Petroleum uh, uh, industry, industry Bill, which we felt by now would have gone far. But then, of course, COVID-19 came and it slowed down a lot of things. But if there's one thing that I will tell you we are determined to ensure that we finish before the end of the year, it is passing the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. All right. So it's a good time for us to take our next break on the program. But don't forget, uh, when we come back, I will allow the Attorney General of the Federation to speak to this. The President, Muhammad Buhari, constituted an electoral reform committee headed by Senator Ken Inamani, a former Senate president. What becomes of that kind of report? And what should INEC be looking forward to? Can INEC do uh, 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 cancel a party candidate because of uh, disqualification, because of uh, qualification? So we'll talk more about those issues when we come back from this break, everyone. Join us again. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us on this fixed Nigerian elections town hall put together by Yaga Africa uh, alongside the EU and ECAS. At the center of it is Channels Television, uh, a collaborator in all of these, and our eyes on how we can get Nigerian elections better. So let's get back to the conversation. But first, it's been 17 days of fierce competition for the fixed elections NG video contest. Power and diverse voices sharing their views on how we can reform Nigeria's electoral process from across generations. The old, the young, and the very young across geopolitical zones, women, men, and persons living with disability. Nigerians speaking with one voice and making one demand. Now is the time to fix our elections for the better. Hundreds of videos, emails, and message 14 winning videos, but above all, Nigerians winning together. Congratulations to all the winners and a bigger congrat congratulations to Nigerians who share their videos and will remain committed to the demand for electoral reform. Top three winners of the Samsung S20 Plus, S20 Ultra Series are one, Tutu Habib is a winner, Sam Samuel Chuku, a winner also, and Omar Farouk, a winner. Others include Mafeni Robeme, School Sanders, Hafsat Abubakar, Goskine Ifai, Last Prophet, Ediagmo Obozoka, Salman Ajibola, Dr. Moise Banire, Zeved Aroyale, Dr. Emmanuel Biri, and Samaj James. They each get free 10 gigabyte internet data bundles. Thank you so much for participating. And let us show you some of the polls which we engage you and we were asking you. One of these uh, is the fact that we asked, we said, which of these functions should be removed from INEC? Some of the options, uh, voter registration, reg regulation of parties, constituency creation, prosecuting offenders. This is how you have voted. Also, we asked that, in your opinion, what can Nigeria do to increase voter turnout for elections? And these are some of your responses. Online voter registration, increased security, voting from any location, hold all elections one day. Thank you so much for your participation there. Let's get back to uh, our Abuja studio. Let me get uh, Mr. Ezenwa Nwago, is the Executive Director of Partners for Electoral Reforms. Mr. Nwago, uh, for you, is the manner in which political parties are run in terms of what is spent for elections and how INEC manages all of that satisfactory to you? Well, uh, Shun, I, I think that um, political party administration uh, have suffered some hijack um, from, from 1999 to about 2003, when President Olusegun Obasanjo was the president of the country, uh, when he began to um, meddle directly in the affairs of how political parties organized, and that weakened internal party democracy in the sense that the organs of the political party were not allowed to um, actually function and, and imposed a new lexicon in 
um, party administration by, by appropriating to himself the leader of the party. And then the governors themselves became the leaders of the party. And so um, everyone outsourced people within political party administration, outsourced their functions and responsibilities to, to those executives. And those who took over from 2007 up to now have not been able to distance themselves from that and allow, you know, the organs, elected organs of the political party to function in a way that can deepen that very structure of democracy. That, that, that affected, uh, quite frankly, um, the um, political party administration. But beyond that, um, organizing within the political party also became very transactional. It, it, the relationship was not that of, um, a, in most cases, people who either became candidates or aspirants had to pay through a very, very, um, pay through a humongous amount of money to, to become candidates of the political party. And when they do pay those humongous amount of money, the delegates also, uh, the delegate system, whether it is uh, direct or indirect, because the members do not pay dues, they, you find that all the activities of the political party are organized by the executive. If there is going to be a convention, in most cases, you find out that the vehicles to transport the people to the venue of the congresses or the conventions are provided by people in the executive. If there is going to be accommodation requirements, the, that is provided by people already in government. So that hijack of party organization, you know, separated the party in an organic manner from those who should own it, who, who are the members of, of, the, of the political party. So I make in terms of political party monitoring, um, um, you, would, you would ask whether the, the constitution itself empowers them to play the kind of role that they should play in terms of whipping um, the political parties into line. For instance, the audited accounts of the political, most of the political parties, if you ask for them, if you ask Kainek whether many of them have submitted those audited accounts, they may be uh, in, in, in a situation where we are, INEC does not have those, those, uh, those reports because the political parties will not do so. And if they don't, what will INEC do? Are there sanctions within the framework of, of uh, whether, whether INEC guidelines or the constitution that allows INEC to wield the big stick? That's, that's not going to happen. When, uh, when political parties or organize congresses, um, INEC monitors, but after monitoring, what do you do with what you have monitored? Can you sanction them? When they field candidates, uh, inappropriate candidates, can you disqualify those candidates? So there are ex lacunas within the law that, that already um, makes, I, makes it difficult for INEC to play the, the, the real oversight responsibility that they should play on, on those political parties. But All right. more importantly is to address the question of ownership of the political parties. The, the people are completely absent in how their political parties are run. They are the, most of the time, you can see that from what has happened uh, in the last, in the last uh, few days with the dominant political parties. All the conversations were happening outside of the owners of the political All parties. All right. Uh, Mr. Eisen, one took yeah. one man who has just one membership card. He's, he's me just one membership card is what he has to be the one to resolve the problem that, first and foremost, the National Executive uh, Committee of the party could not resolve, the Board of Trustees could not resolve, the disciplinary committee of those parties could not even right. deal with those Mr. Nwagu, let, let's quickly ra round up this uh, session because we have yet another interesting session uh, before we end uh, the town hall tonight. And uh, I'm, I'm being told I have just about two and a half or three minutes to end this session before we move into another. And so, uh, I like uh, the INEC chairman to weigh in. I was waiting for, so that he can respond to some of uh, what people have said. Uh, INEC chairman, uh, do you support the proposal that empowers, that, that is asking to empower by law INEC to disqualify candidates? And if also can respond to a few issues, you just have about a minute and a half, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
Okay, thank you, Sean. It's not so much powers to disqualify, but powers for the political parties to do what is right. Uh, you don't have to all the time police the political parties. But you started this program by referring to the number of cases in court arising from the 2019 general elections. You mentioned 809 post-election litigations. Interestingly, we have more litigations challenging the conduct of primaries by political parties than the number of cases challenging the conduct of the main election itself. INEC conducts the secondary election. Political parties conduct the primary election. They give us the candidates that we put on the ballot and put forward to Nigerians to choose from. So that role and responsibility is really very important for the political parties to perform. But let me try and link this up to the issue of cost of elections. One of the biggest areas of cost for the commission from the 2019 general elections is actually electoral litigation. We have been dragged to court almost 2,000 times now. And how many lawyers do we have in the commission? And for each case, we have to hire lawyers to defend, um, to defend um, INIC. Not only that, some of the cases were actually not intended by those who filed them to be prosecuted diligently. Um, out of the 809 cases you mentioned, uh, sorry, 309 cases you mentioned, uh, no, sorry, 809 cases you mentioned uh, post-election, actually 357 were withdrawn by the litigants. So they had no intention to prosecute. But you have to hire lawyers to defend you in court, and we spend and spend and spend. But related to that, you have the issue of um, conduct of by-elections. Elections are not simply costly because we conduct the general elections. Elections are also costly because we conduct by-elections. For instance, as we speak, we have 14 by-elections outstanding, including six senatorial districts. Six senatorial districts um, are the equivalent of two governorship elections. Because you have two or three senatorial districts per state, and we spend and spend and spend in the conduct of these elections. I hope that as part of the reform that we need to um, introduce in this country, attention will focus on the conduct of by-elections. Finally, for me, from Sean, I don't know whether I'll have another opportunity to say this. While we appreciate the lawmakers and all those responsible for ensuring that we reform our electoral process, particularly the electoral legal framework, let me say that from our experience as a commission, we realize that, yes, we need electoral reforms, we need legal reforms, it's very important, but so much actually depends on what the commission makes of its own independence, rather than drawing essentially from statutory provisions. We'll continue to ensure that we do what we are supposed to do courageously. It requires a lot of courage um, to ensure that you achieve um, the kind of uh, free, fair, and credible elections that we require. Let me also say this by way of conclusion. Something happened yesterday in the commission that greatly excited us. We have been deepening the use of technology, not only in management of the electoral process, but also managing the processes that lead to the election. For instance, we had all our stakeholder meetings virtually um, because obviously of COVID, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. But we also introduced the accreditation of observers online. The media will be accredited online. And we said that parties must also submit their nominations online. Recall that before the Kogi and Belsa governorship elections, we had so many litigations simply because the process of submission was manual. We learned from the experience of what happened and insisted that all parties, all political parties, must file their nominations online. We created a dedicated portal for that. I was in the office yesterday, I was looking at the clock. By 13 minutes to five, all the political parties had filed their nominations. We didn't even have to wait until the 6 p.m. All right. Uh, including uh, Engineer Yabagi's party, the, the, so, the ADP. So we, we, the, the we need to go, uh, so uh, Chairman, greatly, uh, greatly, because of our time, we're going to need to quickly wrap that. up uh, this uh, segment. And uh, let me thank you so much, uh, Professor Mahmoud, for your thoughts there. Uh, the Attorney General, uh, we just have about a minute for your final interventions before we go, but a lot of people want you to talk on uh, this very 
uh, report by headed by Senator uh, Ken Inamani. Uh, is President Buhari thinking of making use of that report, which he constituted? We just have about a minute to wrap up. Indeed, um, the report has been in use. First, at a point when the report was submitted, we had cause to have um, uh, extensive interaction with INEC for the purpose of building certain consensus relating to it. We had cause to as well engage the judiciary for the purpose of perhaps building certain consensus relating to it. And arising from those interactions, we had cause now to, um, uh, uh, to somehow put across for consideration of the National Assembly uh, amendment and alterations, uh, constitutional amendment and alterations that has to do with election and electoral process. And as it is arising from our mutual and collective interaction and consensus building, we have succeeded in working with the National Assembly for the purpose of having in place an interface committee that now gives us an opportunity working with the National Assembly to see what consensus we can bring about as it relates to electoral reforms, among others. So it is indeed arising from that that the National Assembly is now working toward the new electoral bill. But for the purpose of clarification of issues, three fundamental reasons were responsible for the failure on the part of the president to assent to the amendment to the Electoral Act. One, arising from it, the powers of INEC as contained in the Constitution were substantially undermined by that bill as presented to the president. For example, the powers of INEC to put, I mean, to fix dates for election, to, uh, I mean, to exclusively determine the order of election among others were undermined. Secondly, arising from international conventions of which Nigeria is indeed a signatory, you are not expected as a nation to effect uh, amendments to electoral act six months before the conduct of the election. And then thirdly as well, election is a process that takes a longer period of time, a cycle of four years. And uh, you are now seeking for constitutional for electoral act amendment three months before the election, thereby changing the goalpost when the game is already on. So these are some of the uh, reasons or the circumstances that make All it right. impossible and impracticable for the president Honorable to minister, consider assent to the electoral act. Uh, Honorable then. Minister, uh, just a moment. Please hold your thoughts because I'd like to keep you for uh, just <laughs> some more moments. Uh, let me uh, allow uh, Senator Bamdele to give us his closing uh, thought in 30 seconds. Senator Bamdele, what is your committee doing to ensure that uh, party primaries and uh, emergence of candidates are, are free and fair and sanitized? In 30 seconds, please. Well, again, that's more about internal party democracy and uh, not so much about what, um, <clears throat> I mean, the government can force down the, the, the throats of the various political parties. Uh, but it is important that parties will respect, I mean, participants will respect the constitution of their parties, like I said before. And this, this is also part of what is being addressed as one of the 26 clauses uh, in the uh, amendment uh, uh, electoral um, act amendment bill. And let me just say this here in rounding up, and, and I know a lot of Nigerians are interested in what's going on. I do not see a repeat of what happened before by the time this bill is concluded and represented to Mr. President. All the stakeholders are on board here. This is INEC at the center stage. Of course, the office of the Attorney General, the Attorney General himself is here. That is the person that will advise Mr. President to what bill to sign right. and which bill he should not sign. He's a part of this process. Right. The legislature, of course, is in the saddle. As far as we are concerned, the civil society right. is involved. Senator, so I think we, we just need to sustain break. this yeah. collaborative effort. Yeah. Yeah, all right. We need to sustain this collaborative effort to ensure that all of us are able to work out something in a collaborative and inclusive manner that will ensure that largely we are on the same page, and then we can make the desired progress in this regard. I must sincerely thank everyone that has participated on this very segment. There is yet another very interesting segment just around the corner. When we return from the break, it's about election security 
and the issue of uh, don't get away, I will tell you when we put up. First time with us, let's get back to the conversation. I have uh, the chairman of House Committee on INEC, Honorable Aisha Duku. Uh, she's on Zoom with us. And in our Abuja studio, I have the Minister of State for Labor, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Mr. Festus Keyamo, and also another Senior Advocate of Nigeria, rights activist, Mr. Mike Ozekome. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the program tonight. Uh, the Attorney General of the Federation is still with us. Before I come to Abuja Studio, let's get some thoughts here in Lagos. Dr. Akin Akinbolu has uh, since been with us. Uh, Doc, you've been listening to some of these conversations. Your mainstream or your area of expertise is how uh, the issues of media, isn't it? And in all of this, what comes out to you, uh, 2023 election is just a few years ago, I mean, a few years away, but we have Undo and Edo election. Is there anything that comes out to you that we need to urgently work on? Yeah, a number of things. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. A number of things. Uh, first is the issue of um, security and the security affects the media as well. Uh, when elections uh, take place uh, in Nigeria, governorship elections, presidential elections, national assembly elections, all of these elections, we find situations where uh, different kinds of actors, uh, security agencies or uh, representatives or candidates or political parties, uh, program crisis in you know, attack people, including uh, media professionals, journalists on duty, and that goes on, you know, to affect you know, the credibility, you know, of the, of the elections. Uh, another issue is the issue of transparency, uh, which you have been talking about, and I'm happy that has come out very strongly in the conversation here from many angles. Um, transparency, election spending, campaign spending, campaign expenditure. Uh, it's an area, you know, of a very big challenge. And the media has a role, you know, to play there. Uh, a lot of the materials that go out as campaign materials uh, during elections uh, go through the media. And uh, what we have seen uh, is that political parties uh, make use of that avenue, you know, to do a lot of things. They spend a lot of money, but uh, it's difficult, you know, to see transparency in this process because we also find third party advertisers you know, coming into the process and at the end, you know, you don't know. Uh, we think that it's important, for example, you know, for the media to come into this uh, in such a way that uh, whatever uh, expenditure uh, takes place uh, on, uh, the, uh, on campaigns through the media, there will be disclosure uh, through the media to appropriate authorities, whether it's uh, INEC or some other uh, authorities, agencies, you know, as time goes on. Uh, one other thing, you know, that really um, uh, bothers um, us, you know, in the media is access. Access, you know, of uh, political parties. Uh, a lot of people, you know, talk about access, you know, they say, uh, but what we find is that in government-owned, public, uh, publicly funded uh, media organizations, uh, opposition parties are mostly denied access, you know, to the media. Uh, this is not right, this is not done. Uh, we believe that uh, in this, uh, going forward, in the reform of the electoral process, there will be equitable, at least equitable access you know, for right. political parties uh, uh, in the media uh, right. during the electoral process. It gives us a very good premise for us to start in this next conversation. But uh, don't forget that we have audience participating in our Abuja City and Lagos studio and uh, of course uh, virtually have another person since we're speaking about <laughs> what the media should do and the role of the media and uh, impact dr kasim akinreti is uh, the chairman of the nigerian union of journalists here in lagos uh, we'll get his uh, uh, his thoughts on uh, he's in here is here with us in our lagos studio Dr. Uh, Akinreti, uh, give us your view on uh, uh, what some, some of the major issues you think uh, should be addressed. Uh, I think uh, number one is in, in arrested the impunity of the political gladiators. And in most cases, uh, the media also always you know, the punching bag. Apart from political gladiators, also have the security agencies who obviously doesn't know that we are partners in progress. And then they also 
you know, throw um, caution to the winds about right? actually, you know, attacking journalists. I think this is extremely important because without the media, this is an extreme initial part of the electoral process. Nothing could happen. The, the, the other thing which is also important is how can the media be more empowered? How do people respect the media opinion in terms of, uh, you know, if there are infractions by the political parties or even the, uh, you know, the electoral empire, how do you trust the judgment of a journalist? For example, if journalists have done investigation about certain infractions against the electoral laws of the country, against some you know, party officials, and we're putting this to the fore. Does the people, does, I mean, the, the, act, the actors, do they respect it? And of what effect will it be? So, but in the situation where you have culture of uh, you know, impunity, everybody believes that they're going to go cost free. Those who have been arrested, for example, media has been able to show, to give evidence of infractions during elections. So, did the police arrest those people? What has happened to them? All right. So well, these are the issues that I right. think will affect so, you know, elections if care is not taken. Dr. Akinreti, yeah, thank, thank you for your thoughts there. So let's take some of these issues up. And also I know that uh, Mr. Benson Olugbo of the Claim Foundation has since joined us from our Abuja uh, studio. And also I can see Honorable Aisha Duku there. It's good to see you, Honorable. Uh, let's begin this conversation on electoral justice and security. Um, a major concern, Honorable, and your committee, what are you doing in that respect? We saw what happened in Kogi State, we saw what happened in Bayasa State, when people uh, are, think that their lives are not secured, prop people are being maimed, killed, properties destroyed in the name of election. Honorable, Honorable, I guess you have to unmute, uh, but just in a moment, let me, as she unmutes herself, uh, let, let's get uh, uh, Mr. Festus Kayamo uh, to, to weigh in. Um, there's definitely a lot of work to do, isn't it, uh, 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 as an advocate. Give us your thoughts on the issues or what the major causes of these issues of insecurity at our elections. Well, first of all, I think we must be honest enough to say that all the parties are guilty of this. So it's a major concern. Um, we have had rising cases of insecurity, violence, and then, of course, you know the electoral process is uh, mad when people cannot vote in an atmosphere that is devoid of um, uh, violence. And so it, it, it does affect the credibility of elections. What can we say but to say that uh, the law enforcement agencies should, of course, uh, do their jobs? Because this has been with us since 1960, and we keep talking about it over and over and over again, and it's not going away tomorrow. Um, there are situations where the law enforcement agencies are also compromised by ruling parties over the years, because you have a situation where the head of agencies, security agencies, are appointed by the government in power. So it is not a question of today or yesterday, it has always been with us. So we must find a way around that to see whether perhaps we can have security of tenure for heads of security agencies. Perhaps if we have security of tenure, then they will not be, af they will not, uh, be afraid of being removed if they don't uh, play the ball of certain, you know, certain uh, political actors. So if we have security of tenure, perhaps it can help because I have tried to you know, find a way around this, but it's not just going away. Even if one party wants to play by the rules, the suspicion, I, I had a conversation about, um, about this with um, the election monitors when they came at the last election, the foreign uh, observers. And I said, look, even if one party wants to play by the rules, it's always the suspicion of whether the other party will also abide by the rules too. So it's always a situation of, somebody trying to meet violence with violence. Because if I want to be a like gentleman, the other party will come and overrun me, and then all of a sudden, the, the, the process is over. So, we have to look back at perhaps the security architecture, see how we can strengthen it, how we can give them a, a 
some a sense of security or security of tenure where they can be totally insulated from politics. I think that is the key to insulate the, the security agencies from politics in such a way that they can do their jobs the way you know they should do their jobs. All right. Let me bring in. Uh, don't forget that we still have uh, the Attorney General of the Federation. I wanted uh, some views to come on the table so that we can get your views on some of these, so that uh, perhaps your reaction on uh, some of the issues. Let me get. Uh, I understand that Honorable Duku, if Honorable Duku can, uh, we can hear Honorable Duku now. Uh, we wanted to know what your committee uh, is doing in that regard as to the issue of electoral uh, election security. I, I want to say that part of the amendment is the being on the creation of the Electoral Offenses Commission. And uh, this has been proposed, as you can see, right from the Waste Commission to the latest one by Ken Namani. So part of the amendment is going to take care of that by the establishment of the Electoral Offenses Commission. But let me say that part of the stakeholders are Nigerians. And if Nigerians are willing to sacrifice, I think the better for all of us. Because the Electoral Commission is not going to... Uh, we're having difficulties with um, with that. Uh, let me get uh, Chief Mike Ozekome, as an advocate of Nigeria, to, to get into the conversation. Uh, Electoral Offenses Commission, like you heard uh, the, uh, the Honorable there, how important will this be? And do you see this happening in this very amendment? I think it's very important. The reason we continue to have um, what you call recidivism, a process where you commit a crime, you are punished, you come back to it, is because you feel that no harm are with you at the end of the day. If you are in one of these advanced countries, you know that to beat traffic, they may not necessarily arrest you there, but by the time you get home the following day, there'll be a ticket waiting for you. By the time you pay like that two times, next time a pull away from a traffic light, you already stop him. I think Nigeria is not practicing democracy. I'm sorry to say that. We are practicing elections. That's all we are doing. After one election, we are looking forward to another. What is happening in all the two political, major political parties today is already a fight over 2023. So when a governor, for example, is elected, he takes time to just work for the first year. From the second year, he's already campaigning. That, that is why electoral officers, the chairman, they have the shortest reign in Nigeria. Since 1964 elections of Ayo Eswa to, 19, um, um, uh, to Chief Michael Ani of 1979, who, who conducted the elections that brought in Shil Shagari, to Fedeko uh, of Justice of Ye Whiskey, the man who said if he saw one million naira bribe, he would collapse when they accused him falsely of taking bribe. Up to people like Dagogo, uh, Justice Akpata, uh, Maurice Iwu, um, 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 the president, Atayru Jega, the present uh, uh, chairman, the problems have always been the same because politicians in Nigeria, they take it that it is a do or die battle for them to win elections. And people, because they don't have any other uh, occupation, most of them, they just, they see in politics that should be a vocation they see it as an occupation. They don't have any business address. They don't have any occupational address. So a, a person who is raising billions of Naira, where the Electoral Act precise one billion for presidential elections, 200 million Naira for governorship elections, 40 million Naira for senatorial, 24. In fact, that is just like wetting the ground when they want to start contesting. How, how do you spend such money how do you go to banks to take loans because you want to serve your people? It is not because they want to serve their people. It is because they want to butter their bread, a system of come and chop politics. So the, a, an election um, uh, offenses tribunal 
is the right way to go. Punish these people. If a person is caught, you are prosecuted, you are jailed, then you are banned. For, for example, the amendment should show that you'll be banned for the next 10 years and you won't contest again. With that stigma on you, others will begin to, to take you and know that it is dangerous to, to, to be corrupt uh, with election. They arm their followers and they arm them with guns, with machetes to go and do. Meanwhile, their children are abroad in the best Ivy Leagues. Some of them having palaces all over the world. But they call the, the Franz Fanon's wretched of the earth, the hoi polloi, to come to the streets and carry guns to kill each other. And then they run away. Once they begin to make examples of these people, then they will know that um, the game is over. I think for as long as we leave them, they will continue to come back. All right. It's recidivism. Uh, so l l let's get uh, Mr. Benson Olubo uh, of Clean Foundation. Uh, before elections, Clean Foundation will come up and give uh, views on uh, the the yellow spots, the uh, the red spots for elections. Uh, this time around, what are your findings? Uh, the findings of your organization on the major causes of electoral violence. Thank you, Sheryl. Uh, the, 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 the causes of electoral violence, they've not really changed. It's still politicians. I think they are the, the, the worst culprits. Uh, politicians are the bad news of politics in Nigeria. Because they, 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 they arm um, thugs, they cause problems, um, they, they, they use money to buy. You know, what is actually happening now is injunction. Everybody, there's a cartoon I saw that um, you can go anywhere and procure injunction. So the key problem we have in our electoral process and that is a key driver of violence in Nigeria is politicians. Then after that, you see that they arm thugs, they use money to corrupt judges. They, I, I mean, there's also that problem of internal party democracy. And of course, we see it everywhere, that internal party democracy is actually one of the problems that is also causing problems. And then there's the issue of courtism um, and, and, and also drug abuse. These are issues that we need to deal with because they have ways of fomenting trouble. And if you look at critically at what causes all these things, it's also the, the appetite for politicians to capture power by all means possible. And that is actually a key driver of violence in Nigeria, that an average Nigerian politician wants to do anything humanly possible to capture power. And, and I agree with what has been said here, that the, the interest is not really to, to serve. Because if interest is to serve, why will we procure arms? Why will we kill Nigerians? Because we want to rule. Why will we go to that extent of causing mayhem, of kidnapping, of killing, of using talks at all venues and every places um, to, to cause problems? In fact, they also corrupt security agencies. We have noticed even in some of our reports that security agencies said, we want to do this thing normally. But sometimes they don't have welfare, the normal welfare that security agencies should have when they go on election duty, they don't have it. So they are, they are left at the whims and caprices of, of, of politicians who also bring brown envelopes to corrupt them. So at the fulcrum, at the center of our problem, our electoral management in Nigeria is politicians, and I All think right. we need so, to deal with it yeah, essentially. So, uh, before I Another get thing, I also the view want to... of uh, the Attorney General to react to some of these issues, because it will come on your table at some point, AGF, on how we can get these things fixed. Let me get Mr. Festus Okoye, National Commissioner with INEC. You perhaps have been... Uh, INEC at some point told Nigerians that we will not conduct elections if we do not know that elections are going to be secured. Has INEC been able to find a way out, a fix for this problem that you have identified, election security or insecurity as the case may be? Uh, well, uh, um, at the level of the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security, uh, we've been addressing the whole issue about election security. And you know also that um, Section uh, 26 of the Electoral Act uh, empowers the Commission uh, not to proceed with any election if we perceive that there may likely be a breakdown of law and order or likelihood of a breakdown of law and order. What is important here is that 
in every election, for instance, during the 2019 elections, the commission deployed almost a million ad hoc staff to go and conduct this election. And some of these ad hoc staff are students of federal tertiary institutions, some are uh, UCO members serving the nation. And I don't think that any electoral commission what is sought, we deploy young men and women to go and die. So to that particular extent, we've made it very, very clear uh, to the political parties and all the candidates that if the commission perceives that there may, likely, there may be the likelihood of breakdown of law and order or they are going to unleash violence on some of our ad hoc staff, that we are not going to proceed with that particular election. So I think that uh, going forward, uh, the political parties and the candidates are learning uh, the critical lessons and they, they, they are aware that this particular commission is determined to protect the sanctity of the electoral process and that if they unleash violence on ad hoc staff or if they create an atmosphere of fear uh, and anxiety in any electoral process that we may not likely go ahead with that particular election. Uh, so I think that we are determined and we have the courage uh, to uh, uh, pull through it and the political parties are aware that we are not going to um, uh, uh, take, uh, that, that we are not going to tolerate a situation where um, violence will be unleashed on ad, ad hoc staff. And All so right. I think that they know that and they are not uh, taking it lightly. And we, we, we hope and, and pray that as we move towards the Edo governorship elections, that they will not dare the commission because the commission will, um, in a very determined manner, enforce the provisions of the Constitution and also enforce the provisions of the Electoral Act in terms of making sure that we protect the integrity of the electoral process. All right, uh, because one of the issues that are being raised is that if anybody is identified or fermenting trouble, what happens to that person? Are you going to disqualify the person or what happens? But let me get the Attorney General back to the conversation now. Attorney General, I'd like you to respond to some of the issues that are being raised, but a critical one here, uh, Honorable Minister, is the fact that things have changed Coronavirus has affected a lot of things, including our economy. We do not have as much money again. And our elections are expensive, as has been highlighted. Going forward, is the government thinking or rethinking the amount we spend on elections? Well, um, let me start by addressing the first issue as it relates to election insecurity. I think the major problem Videvelin our ability to address insecurity associated with election is absence of institutional mechanism that is that can checkmate the prevailing insecurity associated with elections. At the point of the election, there are two critical stakeholders, the politicians and indeed INEC. INEC was fundamentally and substantially interested in the conduct of the election in its own right. The politicians, on the other hand, are substantially interested in the outcome of an election. So within that context of consideration, you have ad hoc staff manning the polling units at each and every location. Now, within the, this circumference, there is no particular institution responsible for enforcement of laws relating to the security of election and electioneering process. That is where the recommendation of Inner Money Committee comes handy. If we have in place National Electoral Offenses Commission, for example, the commission will be saddled with exclusive responsibility of ensuring enforcement of laws associated with insecurity relating to the election process. So the implication of it is at the point of election, while you have INEC concentrating on the conduct of the election, you equally have politicians interested in the result of the election. You as well have an institution saddled with the responsibility of ensuring security of the election by of ensuring that the laws applicable to the security uh, of the elections are indeed enforced. So the implication, the further implication of this is that at the end of the day, those, those responsible 
four breaches associated with insecurity in the election, those people that in one way or the other are affected have an, a certain commission, a certain place or an institution where they can effectively lodge complaints and then where, which will at the end of the day be saddled with the, the responsibility of profiling them for prosecution. But because of the absence right. of institutional mechanism that enforces the laws associated with security of the election, at the end of the day, by the time the elections are over, you do not have witnesses to establish infractions because the ad hoc staff must have left to their respective places, respective destinations. You will not have a particular point of lodgement of um, uh, complaint that will, at the end of the day, ensure the profiling of the associated infractions that are caused in the conduct of the election. Why? Because one, the ad hoc st staff that could naturally be uh, witnesses to the incident that happened at the point of the election relating to breaches have left to their respective uh, destinations. Two, there is no a, 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 a certain institution provided in the, uh, relating to the conduct of the election where you can effectively lodge a complaint. Uh, Honorable Minister. And there is no yeah. established institution so, uh, that can, at the end of the day as well, ensure that adequate profiling is effected at the point of the election relating to security breaches. Honorable so to my mind, I think, other than the conduct of the, individ uh, the, 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 the stakeholders in the election process, the INEC, there exists indeed an effective deal for an institution that will saddle with the responsibility of ensuring security at the election, and that can effectively be done by, a com uh, by an agency that is specifically saddled with that uh, responsibility statutorily or through legislative process. Honorable Minister, uh, the first question I ask, because we are out of time now, but I'd like to uh, give another 30 seconds whether or not you can be able to answer that question and perhaps also uh, give a commitment to Nigerians that, uh, to assure Nigerians whether or not the president will commit to ensuring that electoral amendment law will be amended or signed to or assented before the 2023 elections. President has ever been committed to the election and elect uh, electoral process and the advancement of democracy as far as the Nigerian state is concerned. But one thing you cannot certainly find in the president is conceding to an, uh, an arrangement that is inconsistent with the prevailing laws, inconsistent with the constitution. So within the context of legality of electoral act amendment, I give you my commitment that the president will certainly assent provided there are no constitutional infractions, provided that there are no breaches associated with the international conventions embedded in the ele uh, Electoral Act as amended. Uh, so let's get uh, the, sen uh, the two senior advocates uh, of the uh, senior advocate of Nigeria that are in Abuja, you know, back into the conversation and get their, their final views on the issues of uh, electoral justice and security in Nigeria. Where do we go from here? Uh, I have just about 40 seconds each uh, for the two senior advocates. Uh, let me begin with uh, uh, Mr. Festus Keamo. Where do we go from here to get things right? Well, I said before that it's a very complex situation. We can't walk away from here and think we have, um, we have just solved the problem by you know, mentioning the Electoral um, Offenses Tribunal. I'll give you a practical situation. You think that thugs who ripped or who killed for the ruling party to win an election will ever be arraigned? Why do we like talking English and uh, just semantics? Thugs who, who, who rig for the ruling party and the ruling party wins, the police that works for the ruling party will charge those photo courts. They will not. So we are, we are far away from the problems. I do not subscribe that. That is just a single solution, five electoral offenses tribunal. This is the law I practice in this country. I know the politics behind charging people to court. It is not as easy as that. We are still back to finding a solution to that problem. So what, what, in one statement, uh, Mr. Kayamo, what is the solution? The solution, I said, is to make sure that, that those law enforcement agencies that should charge them to court, they are insulated from politics in such a way that the CEO, the president, cannot remove them at will. 
let them do their work. Mr. Uh, uh, Chief Michael Zakome, do you agree with your colleague there? Uh, it goes beyond that. We should make politics very, very less attractive. Politics is too attractive now. It's mercantilistic. Just, it's just bizarre. That's just all. And then the second point is that we should make INEC truly, truly independent. We must look at Section 153 of the Constitution that makes INEC a part of the executive bodies in Nigeria. Where it is not insul insulated, for example, from the executive. And we all know that the executive is always more powerful than the legislature and the judiciary, which Alexander Hamilton in his Federalist Paper number 78 said is the weakest arm of government. You must insulate INEC from the over overbearing influence of the executive, make, for example, the appointment of the INEC chairman to be by the NJC, then to be confirmed by two third majority votes of the Senate. All right. So that when the chairman feels that he has tenure of office and that the executive is not breathing down his neck, he may be able to do his job. But as it is today, a, 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 a nine chairman can be removed All right. with um, um, a snap of the finger. Chief Michael Zakome, thank you so much for, for the thought there. But uh, we, we're just coasting home, and uh, it's going to be an interesting way to end the show uh, with the voice of a woman in talking about inclusion, political inclusion. Bukola Osidibo of World C is here to give on the issue of women participation. It's just in 30 seconds and give us your word so that we can close now. What is the state of things in 30 seconds? Okay, thanks, Shion, for this opportunity. Well, listening to all the speakers speaking, um, I would, like you said, speak from the point of inclusion. Um, for Nigeria, for example, in terms of um, reforms, the, the two major laws governing elections in Nigeria, they have to be deliberate in terms of inclusion of women in the political space. Take, for example, there are some state houses of assembly in Nigeria that are the House Committee on Women Affairs are still headed by men. Permit me to say, does that mean that there is not one single woman that could be nudged or convinced to join a political party to contest the election for the singular purpose of right. occupying that particular position? So until we are deliberate in terms of including women, we cannot have an increase in women's political participation in Nigeria. Bukala Osidibo of Wati, thank you so much for your thought. And I must sincerely thank uh, my distinguished guests in our Abuja studio, the Attorney General of the Federation, and also the Minister of State for Labor, Mr. Fessor Skeyamo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Chief Mike Ozekome, uh, Mr. Odlubo there from Clean Foundation, and Mr. Fessor Skeyamo, always good to see you uh, in your boot jacket. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. And also, uh, Dr. Akingbolu, thank you so much for coming tonight and our guests in our Buja and Lagos studio as well as our virtual audiences. Thank you so much everyone for participating. I guess with uh, Yaga, the EU and ECAS have started a conversation that our elections must count in Nigeria. We need to fix it. The conversation has started. You can take it on and we can ask that elections in Nigeria must count. Thank you so much, everyone. On behalf of all the crew at Channels Television, thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.